Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ASUS PC Day Hour Hardware Stream and uh, today is going to be an exciting day. Of course, it's one that I think a lot of us have been waiting for and that's going to be, of course, with the launch of the brand new, uh, of course, 13th Gen Series processors. You can see I've got one right there, actually the 13900K, but of course we've got the introduction of not only the 13900K, the 13700K, but also the 13600K and of course we've got a slew of motherboards. So uh, we've got, of course, an entire range of motherboards and if you guys haven't checked out, of course, our first look previews and some of the recent content uh, we've already covered a pretty much uh, a large amount of our motherboard stack, including, of course, the ROG Maximus series, the ROG Strix series, the Tough Gaming series, as well as, of course, uh, the Prime series. But uh, for this stream, we're going to be recapping them all. We're also going to be very exciting, actually touching on three new additions uh, to help to kind of round out the Z790 series of base motherboards. So we're going to have the brand new Maximus Z790 Apex, which is absolutely stunning. Uh, it's brand new in terms of a new design aesthetic with an actually white PCB as well as a white design accent. It absolutely looks fantastic. Uh, and let's see uh, who we've got uh, joining us here on the stream. We've got Sue Men joining us. Happy to have you here. Hey, the Poets, man. Happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much uh, for joining us here on the stream. We've got Nelson joining us. We've got, of course, PGPCs noting that the Extreme is looking good, and I would definitely agree. We've got Michael also joining us here on the stream as well. Thanks for joining us here. And we've got quite a number of other people here. Uh, we've got uh, Dimple also joining us from the stream. And Stardust932 uh, is saying that he really likes the look of the Apex. And I would definitely agree. We're going to be touching on the Apex and some of the cool things that it's going to be bringing to the table. We've also got the actual unveiling as well as for the ProArt series-based motherboard. For those of you that are interested in the ProArt series, especially for those that are interested in productivity, you know, you might be in advanced content creation, things along those lines. And we've also actually got, in addition to the Tough Gaming lineup with the Tough Gaming Z790 Plus DDR5, variant. So uh, just like the last generation where we had a DDR4 and a DDR5, we're definitely going to be giving you that flexibility that if you want to adopt into DDR5 for Tough Gaming, you'll have that as an option. And as always, uh, in this live stream, we'll also hopefully give you a little bit of context in terms of understanding the product stack, the features, the functions, the designs. We've got some new cool stuff that we haven't actually even had in the prior generation in terms of Z690 and 12th gen uh, that we'll also be touching into, uh, such as our brand new, actually dynamic cache switcher technology, which is going to allow you even get more performance from these 13 gen series cpus um, this is going to be a really cool feature which complementary to our asus aioc technology we'll actually be diving a little bit more into into tomorrow's live stream we'll actually be talking about uh, overclocking and doing a little bit of live overclocking actually doing some high uh, mt ddr scaling and some things along those lines so if you guys are interested in that make sure to also go ahead and check us out for that stream as well all right, so uh, let's get ready to go ahead and jump into it. I don't want to take too much time. Of course, uh, let's just, just sh jump straight into the mix. So I think first things first, um, let's go ahead and touch a little bit in terms of just the CPU stack, um, just so kind of everybody knows what we're taking a look at here before we get into the boards. Um, and then from there, why don't you guys let me know in terms of the chat if there's any kind of uh, preference in terms of how we uh, handle kind of the board stack evaluation. So we, of course, have ROG uh, Maximus. We have ROG Strix. We've got Tough Gaming, and we've got Prime and then we've got ProArt. Uh, normally, sometimes I've reserved ROG for the end, but maybe this time around, maybe we want to go the other way around and start off from the high end and then move the way down. Let me know what you guys are interested in and we'll we'll kind of uh, make it work either which way. So uh, let's go ahead and take a little bit closer look here at the product stack. So let's bring up our uh, kind of little bit of slide deck right here. And so we can see this is actually the breakdown in terms of what we've got in terms of the CPU configuration. So it's going to be looking pretty standard to what we had in terms of 12th gen series base CPUs for 13th gen. You've got that 13900K, you've got that 13700K, and you've got that 13600K. So those are pretty much direct replacements for the prior generation. Now do keep in mind that of course um, you could inversely if you wanted to run a 12th gen part on a, Z, a Z790 series motherboard and the other way around. If you have Z 690, of course, you do have full compatibility uh, for, of course, 13th gen, but most users generally don't upgrade gen on gen. I'm probably assuming the majority of you that are going to be considering 13th gen are probably coming from much older platforms. So maybe you're coming from um, 10th gen, 9th gen, 8th gen series-based Intel platforms. Maybe you're coming from first generation Ryzen, or maybe you're even coming from older platforms like x58, x79, x99, um, or maybe, uh, you know, we still got a Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge uh, people that are out there, you know, running things like uh, 2600Ks, uh, 
3770Ks, things along those lines, right? So um, wherever you might be coming from, right, I think there's a lot of features and functions and of course performance, it's gonna be a big uplift. So generally we don't usually see gen on gen base increase, uh, but just for kind of comparison, um, these are of course the same kind of models that we're taking a look at. The big upgrades though that are gonna be important here are gonna be of course the kind of the overall total thread count, right? So the thread count has seen a big uplift for this generation. So you're seeing of course more threads available to you and then ultimately this is just giving you even a higher level of multi-threaded performance. But it doesn't just stop in terms of the multi-threaded performance. We do have specific upgrades not only to the actual processor's core frequency, but also critically another area is going to be uh, the DDR official memory specification support and then also your cache. So uh, the cache right here in terms of whether we're talking about the L3 cache or the L2 crash, see nice jumps up. So you're going to be seeing uh, you got that 36 megabytes, right? 30 megabytes or 24 megabytes. So those are nice uplifts because cache is directly aligned with, of course, CPU performance and application performance. So it's a way to be able to help bump up the performance alongside the increase in clock speeds. And in terms of the clock speeds, you'll see that you've got quite aggressive clock speeds going all the way up to that peak of 5.8 gigahertz. We'll be talking about overclocking expectations in terms of what you can see uh, for kind of the majority of CPUs as you begin to kind of enter into the overclocking stage. I can tell you already off the bat, six gigahertz will be possible. So for those of you that are really kind of interested in that highest level of gaming performance, you're gonna be putting this with, you know, your latest, uh, you know, 3080, 3090, 4080, 4090 based graphics cards or upcoming RDNA graphics cards. Um, you're gonna be able to kind of take the performance even further here under those gaming workloads to really be able to give you the best possible performance. And this is going to be great for, of course, those that are going to be running ultra high refresh rate monitors, whether you're talking about, you know, 360 hertz or upcoming 500 hertz, or even our new, of uh, course, 1440p 360 hertz monitor, or, um, you know, if you're into 4K, although 4K generally tends to be a little bit more GPU bound than necessarily CPU, right? Um, beyond that, most of the other kind of key things that you would want to keep in mind are going to be fairly similar in terms of course, when we talk about PCI lanes, um, the prior generation already helped to introduce PCI Gen 5 for both graphics and M.2. So that's going to be maintained and we'll see how that breaks down in terms of the motherboard layout. Um, but again, I do want to recap here. We see a nice uplift in terms of the DDR5 frequency support. Uh, so you're having 56 uh, mega transfers in terms of the actual core specification where in the prior generation that was going to be DDR4800 uh, mega transfers. Transfers, right, And then for DDR4, there's no specification change. And we'll also be talking a little bit more about kind of the expectation of what you're going to see from the IMC for this generation. So the IMC, if you're not aware, is going to be the memory controller. And when we're talking about overclock speeds, we already know that 12th gen had an outstanding memory controller that could easily support much higher frequencies than 4800, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And the other kind of big one is going to be that outside of this base power, you can see the max turbo power is seeing quite a bit of an uplift across all three of the CPUs, so 181, 253. Um, and now keep in mind that depending on permutations and configurations within the UEFI, uh, of course, you could see even higher levels in terms of the actual power uh, envelope. Uh, but this, of course, can be kind of adhered to if you want to define kind of forcing the CPU to adhere to Intel's kind of default performance limit. But if you want the maximum level of performance, then of course, you'll have more granularity and control to be able to expose that. So those are pretty much your three CPUs that you have available uh, within the kind of the product stack. Um, so that is going to cover the CPU side. And here I'm also going to quickly just give a little bit of a breakdown on the chipset side, and then we're going to get ready to go into uh, the motherboards. So again, if anybody has any questions, don't worry, uh, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'm going to do my best to go ahead and get to those as we go through um, everything here within the stream. Um, but uh, I just kind of want to cover the, the key points regarding kind of the CPU and the chipset and the, the, the overall kind of platform in the very beginning. Okay. Um, and let me go ahead and I can see definitely we've got a good amount of questions there. So don't worry, we will definitely get you covered in that regard. Okay. Um, uh, Wednesday, we'll talk about board availability as well. I mean, most of the motherboards have already kind of been pushed out. There are a couple of new SKUs like uh, the, of course, the Apex, uh, the ProArt, um, the tough gaming model that they're going to be coming out a little bit later. And the, the mixed stream will be coming out actually in the not too distant future. So um, we'll be covering that again in a little bit. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and just bring up kind of this chipset block diagram. Uh, this is just gonna help us to kind of take a little bit of closer look at the overall chipset platform. All right, so uh, as we take a look right here in terms of the chipset stack, right, uh, it's gonna be pretty straightforward, right, when we're talking again about 13th gen Z790, um, 
we're looking very similar in terms of what we saw from Z690. There is a couple of little things that we've done on the motherboard trace layout design where we've done some further optimizations for signal alterity, um, which is going to relate to DDR5, which is going to help to better leverage kind of the improvements that have been made into the IMC, so the integrated memory controller. So that is going to be one benefit that you're going to kind of see, but that's not inherently kind of part of the chipset, right? Um, the biggest item that I would say that you're going to see that would be a quote unquote improvement is that you'll see a change in terms of what are called the downstream links or PCI links where there's essentially an uplift in terms of the number of PCI Express Gen 4 downstream links. On a motherboard, what that ultimately ends up translating to is just giving us a little bit more flexibility to give maybe more Gen 4 links for different types of uh, devices. So that would generally usually be kind of uh, M.2 based SSDs. That's generally where you would see kind of the advantage. Otherwise, things are going to be pretty similar because PCI Express Gen 5 support for graphics, PCI Express Gen 5 support for M.2 based SSDs. The primary, of course, 16 lanes and that four lane allocation there for your primary NVMe, your PCIe NVMe M.2 SSD is also going to be the same. Um, and like I said, uh, the IMC is what dictates really the uh, overall memory speed, right? And so here we saw as I noted already in the prior kind of slide, uh, we have an uplift to that 5,600 mega transfers, right? Uh, for the rest of the information, pretty much standard except for that change in terms of the downstream uh, link. There is also technically a change within the USB 3.2 specification support, so you have the potential to support more. But as always, even as we saw in Z690, this is heavily dependent actually on how the motherboard is designed and what we're attempting to leverage, which can also be introduced, uh, excuse me, that can also be kind of um, complicated by the cost, right? because essentially the more the controllers and the more kind of IO configurations you place on the board, you scale out the cost of the board. So you can already kind of see that in the prior generation, as we scale up to more high-end high boards, you'll have definitely correspondingly have more high-end IO configurations like USB 4 with Thunderbolt support, or uh, you know, 20 gigabits on the uh, internal as well as on the rear. So you'll see already kind of these implementations as we scale things out when we're talking about the boards. All right. Okay, um, so I think that pretty much covers us on the chipset side. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly check see if we've got any quick questions that might be in relation to that. If not, like I said, we're going to get pretty much ready to jump straight into the motherboards, um, start breaking things down, and so we'll kind of go from there. So let me see right here. Um, Ace Jeep is uh, asking about 13900K in terms of the overall wattage. Um, keep in mind that wattage is always going to be defined by workload, right? So if you're predominantly just a desktop user, um, you know, if you're predominantly gaming, even actually if you're doing certain types of content creation, um, it's quite different than, let's say, a sustained multi-threaded workload. So if you're somebody that's doing professionally, you know, content creation and you're doing actually things like where you're rendering across an extended number of cores for an extended period of time, then you'll, of course, see the highest power envelope. But even actually under like editing workloads, if you were to run applications like Adobe Premiere, which do use quite a number of threads, it does doesn't actually saturate heavily the cores in the same way that you would even do uh, if you were to step into like a rendering application or certain types of modeling applications that might be utilizing multi-threaded. So keep in mind that overall power and heat are directly tied to the workload experience. So while you're definitely, well, you're going to see a lot of, I think, reviewers be able to touch on kind of the peak levels, um, always kind of moderate that against really what you're doing in your system because there could be sizable deltas. We showed this in the last generation um, also with 12th gen and even our kind of our overclocking guide where we talked about some people saying you can't overclock the CPU because it's going to be too hot and um, I showed actually live demos of overclocking you know the CPU with actually a tower heatsink as well as with a 240 millimeter AO not even a 360 millimeter AO and gaming and not having any issues when you talked about even running higher voltages higher frequencies with the cooler when you're talking about workloads that I'd say are more representative of the majority of users again if you're a professional or a production workflow user then you have to account for a course that you will be looking at the higher power limits. But again, there'll be options that you can also help to kind of balance out how your thermal environment is working in relation to your system on some of those UEFI parameters that I talked a little bit earlier about. So uh, that's just kind of something to keep in mind, okay? Um, A's Jeep asking here is, can I use the 12900K and the new boards? Yes, you can run a 12900K. You can run any of the 12th gen series. And also, um, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but of course, any one of the B-series based motherboards. So uh, B660, take for instance, is a great series of boards that we have. I think maybe, do I have one right over here? Yeah, I got it. Do I have one over here? Yeah, so this is like, you know, 
This is our, our Pro Art right here. Pro Art B660 board, very cool. Um, we have B660 and both DDR4 and DDR5. Um, I think I've also got an ROG Strix over here somewhere um, for you know B660, but B660 can also course support uh, 12th gen and 13th gen, so you can kind of support either one of those configurations. Um, has anything been announced about a Z790 Maximus Glacial? There is no Maximus Glacial, so there will not be any Glacial for a Z790 chipset, okay? Um, let's see right here. Uh, can older HTC 690 motherboards clock up the RAM to the same speed as the Z790 motherboards? I'll talk a little bit more about that actually in the overclocking stream tomorrow, but uh, I can go ahead and give you some insight here is that the IMC will directly influence this. And as you already saw actually within Z690, we were already able to show actually speeds on um, our motherboards, right? That were easily over the rated actually speeds that were supported by the memory controller at default, right? 4,800, we could run 56, we could run 6,000, 6,400. 6600 right i showed in multiple streams uh running you know 6400 actually across the entirety of our board stack when you were talking one dpc one spc configuration so in two dim um, within four dim configuration of course that again is more influenced by rank density ic and the imc quality and so there you were normally seeing probably closer to about 48 to about 52 some better cpu seeing maybe about 6000 and really really great cpus maybe seeing over 56 to getting over maybe close to about 58, maybe 6,000, right? Um, you will be able to see scaling improvements on Z690 with a 13 gen series processor. But as I noted, right, there's been a little bit of kind of optimization and some of the um, kind of uh, topology and the overall design of the motherboards to help extend margin a little bit more. So overall, I'd say marginally, you will see better DRAM scaling on Z790 based motherboards than you saw on Z690 series motherboards, but you would still be able to see a benefit, okay? Um, I mean, just a couple to see if there's any other questions before we get into the next part right there. Um, hey, Ken, how you doing? Thanks for joining us here on uh, the stream. So Stardust, I think I just answered your question in terms of DRAM right there. Um, all right, so I think we're gonna get ready to kind of go into it. I, I don't wanna, like I said, type too much. If we see kind of more questions, feel free and go ahead and let me know. Just drop them in the chat and I'll go ahead and do my best to go ahead and respond to them when I can, all right? Uh, but um, since we didn't, I didn't necessarily see if we saw a preference, I think let's go ahead and maybe change things around. Let's actually start off, I think, with the ROG Maximus because this way we can also go ahead and take a look at the new Apex board. Um, so we're gonna start now with the kind of the highest in series. So we're gonna start with Maximus series. Well, they're gonna go to the the ROG Strict Series, we'll then go to Tough Gaming Series, um, Prime, and then we'll end things out actually with the Pro Art Series, okay? Um, and before I get into, I guess, the first thing, uh, let's answer one more question here, and don't worry, I will be answering questions, and I will be covering pricing on any of the boards that I will be detailing, although you can see most of the pricing right now available online. Is the Prime Series as reliable as the ROG Series? Yeah, um, all of the motherboards offer great reliability, durability, and component quality. Um, you know, as really kind of, I, I've always tried to talk about in our prior streams, if you check out some of the prior streams, if you haven't, um, the difference really is going to come down more to features, functions, and specifications than it is a perspective that if you get a prime motherboard versus an ROG motherboard, that one is inherently going to be kind of more uh, reliable or overall superior in that respect. Now, technically, there will be power components and certain components that are present on the motherboard that might be rated for higher levels in terms of maybe thermal parameters or even component lifespan. So ROG will always have the absolute best componentry but on the prime series it's still very very high quality and we'll be talking about the power topology and the kind of the vrm design implementation um, so overall you don't need to worry and if you're talking about running like a 13 600k 13700k 13900k if you effectively put in a prime motherboard um so um and you compare that to let's say a maximus z790 hero the performance overall experience is going to be roughly parity there'll be a little bit of a synthetic improvement if you were to measure the performance on the rog board but overall you don't need to kind of be concerned in that regard so um i've got a couple of the I, actually i have actually all three of the rog boards here with me so let's go ahead and start to take some boards out here um of course i have images uh, but we'll, we'll do that so that's going to be the hero um, i've also got the extreme here I'm getting in a little bit of my lifts for today. <laughs> we got the extreme here that we're gonna take a look at also. So let me set that one aside there. And uh, let me get the apex here. Yep. All right, oh, here it is. 
Oh, okay. All right. Oh, and if you guys can tell, look at that right there. Look at right there. Oh, there it is. That is the brand new uh, Maximus Z6, Z790 Apex. Uh, absolutely stunning, stunning board, right? Um, so I think this is really an amazing motherboard, right? Um, in terms of its overall design aesthetic, right? Uh, but uh, not yet. We're going to get into that in a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a tease right there. It looks absolutely fantastic, right? Um, but it's going to be pretty sweet. Okay. So, um, Again, if anybody has any questions there, feel free to go ahead and ask. Uh, I think somebody just asked right there, will there be a uh, Z790-E in white? No. Uh, we will not have any other white motherboards. Uh, it's already been quite an effort to do actually the Apex in white. Uh, we, of course, have the Prime series that we're going to talk about that's also in white. And then we have the ROG Strix Z790A uh, board, which is also in white. So we already have three different motherboards in white. So it's, qu it's quite a bit of motherboards. Um, all right. So uh, let me go ahead and just bring this up here, guys. And uh, we're going to take a look here at this kind of series and we'll kind of jump into it. So, All right, so uh, here we go. Let me go ahead and just get my... Uh, sorry, one second here. Okay. And ROG, here we go. Perfect. All right. So as uh, you noted right there, right, for the ROG series, right, we're going to have the Extreme. We'll have the Hero and the Apex. So, of course, the Extreme is going to be the highest end version of the motherboard, right, that we're going to offer in our lineup, right? So it'll have the most advanced features, functions, specifications. We're going to go through those on this board. Uh, don't worry. We're going to highlight all those things. Uh, the Hero really is my kind of my personal favorite in terms of kind of our series. It's really kind of the best representation, has an awesome set of features and functions. It's a more traditional, of course, form factor in terms of an ATX based specification and then right here um, the apex which we of course didn't show but there it is bam so the apex will be of course the alternate now the big difference of course that you're going to see here is that the apex is of course our more oc centric model and it is a um one dim per channel, uh, one slot per channel based motherboard. So that means that there's only two slots. But of course, with DDR5, that is less of a factor because DDR5, of course, has much higher density, right? You can actually get 32 gigabytes. You can get 64 gigabytes. And in the future, you'll even be able to do 128 gigabytes and actually two dim configurations. That's really one of the key benefits of DDR5. But of course, with two dim configurations, we're going to be able to see uh, significantly higher DRAM scaling. So I can tell you already internally, uh, we have already broken, of course, 10,000 uh, mega transfers, right? So really impressive in terms of the overall DDR frequency and the overall uplift again for Raptor Lake is quite impressive where almost I would say uh, we're seeing kind of 7,000 MT will be kind of the new normal compared to 6,000 MT being kind of the very kind of common target that we saw within uh, 12th gen series and Z690 when we're talking about actually an overclocking target for when you're running XMP enabled memory. So again, uh, these are our highest end configurations. I know that we've had some people asking about when the extreme will be available. Overall time frame should be fairly shortly. I'll see in a little bit moment if I can get the updated kind of information here in terms of kind of the uh, timeline. Um, and then the Apex uh, will have a little bit more of information in terms of channel availability in the not too distant future. So just make sure to keep it tuned. Um, I can tell you that the pricing though on the Apex will be the same as far as the Hero. So these will both be, I believe this is 629. So this will also be 629, okay? So um, let's get ready to go into, I guess the boards. We'll, we'll cover first, I guess the Extreme. Um, so go ahead and bring those slides up and then i'll also go ahead and get a little bit closer on uh, that board right So taking a look here at the extreme, uh, of course, it's our flagship base model, right? We're really always looking to kind of be able to try to do as much as possible when we're talking about the extreme base variant. So uh, if we take a just look at the rear IO, that's a very good representation of kind of what we're going to be having in terms of the highest level of specification support. So you've got two, four, uh, six, ten. So ten USB ports that are going to be on the rear. These are all high speed. There's no legacy ports. You can see that these are also clearly noted in terms of their actual bandwidth. So ten gigabits, ten gigabits, ten gigabits gigabits, but then you also have a 20 gigabit port. And then of course, right here, you see that you have a Thunderbolt port. So Thunderbolt also means that you move up from not just 20 gigabits, but you have 40 gigabit space connections. So uh, you're going to have a very, very high level of throughput that's available to you. So again, 10 gigabits, 
10 gigabits, 10 gigabits, uh, 10 gigabits, 20, and then 40 gigabits, right? And then another nice update from this generation, especially if you're coming from older motherboards, is not just the high speed IO where you probably didn't even have 20 gigabits or of course Thunderbolt, but you also probably didn't have even type C ports, or maybe you might've just had one type C port. You have of course uh, HDMI to be able to leverage uh, the integrated graphics if you do want to utilize integrated graphics support, but I'm pretty sure everybody buying an extreme is going to be running, <laughs> they're going to be running a discrete graphics cards like, uh, you know, our 30 or 30 series or 40 series or an AMD series based graphics card. Uh, you got clear CMOS, BIOS flashback, you got 10G LAN. Um, now 2.5G LAN, I do want to make a note that pretty much all the motherboards that you're going to see that have 2.5G LAN are going to be featuring the latest generation Intel uh, i226 uh, based 2.5 gigabits network controller. So this is the latest generation network controller from Intel, offers great UDP packet performance. Uh, of course, that Intel Pro set. So that is going to be an update there. Now, this also, uh, the Wi-Fi implementation is also going to be a little bit different. Uh, the Wi-Fi implementation, specifically on the Extreme, will actually be a higher performing Wi-Fi chip, and it's the latest generation Intel AX411 chip. Now, what makes the Intel AX411 chip more interesting? Well, you actually have a technology that's called Double Connect, and uh, the cool thing that actually uh, allow, uh, well, the, essentially the way Double Connect works is that two simultaneous bands can actually be connected to at the same time. So you could have, like, for instance, like 2.4, and you could have like the Wi-Fi 6 band be connected at the same time. And so a situation that you might kind of maybe leverage in this scenario is that maybe dedicate the gaming to one specific band, and then you can actually have maybe uh, a browser or, um, or maybe a download of files or other um, connected kind of aspects present on the other band. And then this can actually help to maximize the overall uh, latency performance performance from, let's say, like a gaming perspective. So this is an exclusive feature that is on the Extreme uh, as far as the AX411. So keep in mind that the other boards will still also feature Wi-Fi 6C. So it's outstanding. It's fully backwards compatible with Wi-Fi 6 or even Wi-Fi 5, depending on your router. You do need to have Windows 11 if you want to run Wi-Fi 6E. But if you want to be able to take advantage of this new double connect technology, uh, then do keep in mind that is exclusively on the Extreme with the AX411 chip, okay? Um, there's also some other other kind of cool functionality in terms of aggregation, in terms of the way bands work, you can actually combine two bands together that even have more throughput. So if maybe you have a multi gigabit ISP service, you could actually even have a higher level of throughput speed available to you. Although with Wi-Fi 6 and both with Wi-Fi 6E, you can already achieve actually greater than one gigabits wireless throughput. It's actually not even that unrealistic to be able to see 1.5, maybe even almost two gigabits in terms of wireless throughput, especially if you're matching it with uh, one of our Wi-Fi 6E based routers. So that is a pretty cool design specification. Um, of course, the audio, we'll touch a little bit more of that in a little bit, but this is the Supreme FX audio-based design. Um, these are actually going to be illuminated jacks, so they will actually light up. Uh, optical output, and of course, this has the uh, ALC audio codec and the new ESS Sabre DAC, the 32-bit uh, quad DAC design, which is going to be on the motherboard. You've got the enemy display matrix. Uh, new for this generation also is going to be right here, the actual OLED Live Dash display. This will be a color display, whereas in the prior generation, it was not a color display. And of course, you can still do all the standard stuff as far as having things like frequency, uh, fan speeds, uh, clock speed, excuse me, yeah, frequency and clock speeds. You can have voltages, fan profiles, GIFs, animations, different things like that. The enemy matrix um, supports, of course, GIFs, animations, clocks, uh, a lot of different kind of customization, and it also now supports Asus or Sync support. So there's an actual option that will allow you to kind of synchronize the lighting profile to the rest of your system. I don't have it turned on right now on this system right here, um, but it would work even for the prior generation. This is the Z690 base version. Um, but if I have a little bit of time later, I'll see if I can show you that, guys. Um, and in terms of kind of specification support, of course, four DIMMs right there. You've got the DIMM.2. This board will support up to five M.2 base SSDs, right? And that includes the DIMM.2 add-in card, right? So the DIMM.2 add-in card is going to give you two Gen 4 um, M.2 uh, slots, and then on the motherboard, the motherboard will give you one um, PCI Gen 5 M.2 slot that will be on there, and then two more additional slots. So that'll be underneath the heatsink. And we'll take a little bit of a look at that in a second when I kind of uh, bring over the board and take a closer look at it, right? Um, so that's the other kind of big upgrade. The other big thing, too, is keep in mind is that we're starting out at the high end. As you roll down, you'll see this motherboard has dual PCI Express Gen 5 slots. Now, that could be advantageous whether you want to do like water cooling, have a uh, 
you know, a single slot based card, and then you want to use that secondary slot for something like a PCIe add-in card that might be like our Hyper M.2 expansion card for even more PCI Gen 5 M.2 SSD support. That could be supported because the slot does support PCI bifurcation, right? Uh, but keep in mind that as we kind of go down, you'll see boards that might not have two PCI Express Gen 5 um, slots, right? So that is gonna be a key difference, especially in the higher end series of the motherboards versus the more mid-range or more entry series of the motherboards. But for many users, this PCI Express is not a factor, right? So um, in a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and bring out this board uh, right here and we'll take a closer look at it in the secondary camera. But keep in mind that for people that ask about like PCI Express speeds and how that influences overall performance, right now, PCI Express Gen 4 is not even saturated by a highest end graphics card. So you could put a 3080, 3090, a 4090, and it doesn't saturate PCI Express Gen 4. In fact, even in our testing, PCI Express Gen 3 actually pretty much almost allows for about 100% of level of the performance. And the, the reality is because already, because uh, when you're sending information over to the graphics card, it's not sending over a sustained high level of transfer um, of information across the PCI Express bus. Um, it's sending kind of compressed data that once it hits the cache and it hits the memory for the graphics card, it's stored pretty much there. So there's not a heavy amount of usage. Um, it, storage actually will benefit it more generally from more bandwidth. So going from like PCI Express Gen 3 to Gen 4 to Gen 5. Um, but again, even there, you could argue that the bandwidth, while it's nice, is not necessarily super critical uh, because it depends on how you use the drive, right? Uh, most drives aren't using sustained sequential based kind of workloads. You're generally kind of just picking them. So actually IOPS are gonna be much more important the nominal kind of tend to footprint that you tend to generally see when you're talking about PCI Express drives is probably somewhere around SATA speeds to kind of first generation PCI Express drives. So somewhere between about like 500 to about maybe one gigabit, or excuse me, one gigabit, um, one gigabyte worth of actually throughput that's being realized on the drive. So you don't have to be super stressed about like, you know, hey, it, you know, do I have to run it in PCI Express Gen 4 mode, right? Or, you know, even if I have a reduction in running it, maybe in PCI Express Gen 4 by eight, none of these scenarios are really gonna affect you. So it really comes down to more so, pick the board that's gonna give you the level of expansion support and the IO flexibility that you want, right? Um, so overall, that uh, kind of just covers that point right there. But uh, let me go ahead and show this little nice extreme board here one more time uh excuse me apex board but we're going to take a closer look at the extreme so let me just go ahead and set this one aside here all right and let me get my extreme here all right <clears throat> oh this is such a big board i'm gonna have to make a little bit of an adjustment here for how i position this All right, so uh, let's go ahead and first just prop it up. Oh, such a big board. <laughs> All right, guys, there we go. And uh, I'm gonna take a look here at the questions in a second. So if anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. Let me go ahead and light this guys up for you. So you will notice that of course on this board, it does have right angle base connectors. So um, that is something that you do want to keep in mind when you're dealing with kind of right angle based design. You do want to be a little bit more cautious because there can be kind of more considerations when you install this into a chassis. So you can run more likely into actually mechanical obstruction. Um, it's nice because it looks pretty clean and it's pretty cool, but it's not necessarily always ideal uh, depending on the chassis. So just make sure that your chassis has enough room. So of course you've got the anime display matrix right there. Uh, as you can see right there, you've got the color OLED live dash display. And then right here, um, you might not be able to see it, but we actually have illuminated LED jacks, right? So there's the illuminated LED jacks. And then as we go over to the other side, you also have edge lighting, which is on the motherboard, which looks really cool. And then there's also a little bit of lighting that's uh, down here in the PCH section, which looks pretty nice as well. So there's quite a bit of kind of like aesthetic refinement that's on here. And the board, I think, looks fantastic. Of course, all the RG boards are going to have that kind of clean monochrome aesthetic. Even the Apex, even though it's white, will have that really kind of nice clean clean uh, design aesthetic. Um, so if you want to go with something kind of super refined and you don't want to have any RGB lighting, the boards will look fantastic. But if you want to be able to light them up, they'll also look really good. So I'm going to throw this one underneath here, the secondary camera so that we can take a closer look at it. So give me one sec right here. I'm going to kind of connect it. And I'm also going to take a look here uh, in the questions. So in case anybody has any questions that kind of been uh, 
posted there on anything that I've covered so far, I'll, I'll do my best to go ahead and respond to them. And some people do ask, is there a backplate? There is, is a backplate on this board right here, so you can see there is a backplate on it. Such a big board, I kind of kind of have to fill in the frame there. Okay, all right. Let's go ahead and switch over right here. Um, actually, let me quickly just take a look and see if there's any questions right there before I switch it over into the second one. Nelson says uh, it's a beautiful looking board. I would definitely agree. Great looking board. Um, Davina is saying, has Asus considered pushing some of the premium auto features down to less expensive motherboards? Actually, we already have. Um, so, you know, I would say that, um, you know, we always try to kind of bring down some of those audio designs. Right now, there's no plans to introduce the ESS Sabre DAC into other series motherboards. And part of the reason why is also it's a balancing act because um, while the ESS Sabre DAC definitely adds additional value to it, um, in some of our recent polling, we actually find that now about 50% of users are using USB um, sources in terms of their actual playback, right? Right? So that means like they're using like a USB headset like our ROG Delta, right? So this is actually already has an ESS Sabre DAC and amp built into it, right? Um, and that means that if you had an analog audio design, you actually get no benefit. So it's a balancing act of kind of looking at the users that might still use analog based headphones, where they're going to be positioned, where they have value and where they might be using. Um, so it's it's kind of a tricky situation. And also, of course, if you bring it down in the board stack, you would be increasing the cost. So we do try to balance things out in terms of offering a very good quality uh, audio solution, um, but at the same time, making sure that it's sensibly in alignment with what kind of the users are adopting in that kind of price band, okay? Um, Bain is asking, what power supply would you recommend for a 30, uh, excuse me, a 13900K and a 4090? Uh, my recommendation would probably be a 1,000 watt power supply. A 1,000 watt would be a good option. Um, keep in mind that you don't have to worry so much about transient considerations with the 40 series because the 40 series have better transient performance than the 30 series. So you don't have to worry about kind of these bigger spikes that might have kind of been present within like a 3090 or 3090 Ti or something like that. So I would say that that's a very good choice. Uh, we will, of course, already have our ROG Thor series power supplies, which you can get the thousand watt or 1200 watt we will also have next month the rog excuse me the uh, tough gaming uh atx 3.0 fully modular gold pcus which are atx 3.0 so they'll natively have that 16 pin power connector which would be a great choice in there as well okay so i would definitely uh take a look at that uh somebody asking about z790 formula there is no z790 formula board okay Paskowitz is asking, when was the last white PCB motherboard? Yeah, that's correct. The last white PCB-based motherboard was the Sobronco. That is correct. That is the last of more motherboards. So it's been a very, very, very long time. And it's actually quite challenging. Um, there's a lot of yield considerations and different kind of things that we have to keep in mind if when we do kind of a white PCB. So it's quite challenging. Um, this motherboard, yes, this is a DDR5. Actually, all the Maximus motherboards are only DDR5 because DDR5 gives you the best performance. The reality is that if you're talking about density, frequency, multi-core bandwidth, right? So applying bandwidth from the DRAM to each core in the CPU, which is critical if you want the best multi-threaded performance, DDR5 significantly wins in that regard. DDR4 can still be very good in kind of gaming scenarios, especially with tuned latency um, um, and tuned timings, excuse me, tuned timings for total kind of end latency, but total end latency between DDR5 and DDR4 can be made to be pretty comparable. So overall, it's not really that factor and DDR5 will easily scale to levels of performance that can't be matched by DDR4. Um, so I think holistically kind of our perspective is that it doesn't make sense to limit kind of our best motherboards to DDR4 technology. So uh, we do offer DDR4 though, again, in multiple lines. So we're, our Prime Series will have a DDR4 and our um, Tough Gaming Series will have DDR4 and ROG Strix will also have a DDR4 base variant. But for all Maximus, all Maximus will be DDR5. Okay, let's uh, take a closer look here. All right, so uh, let me see if everybody can see that okay. There we got the extreme board. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, light it up for you guys so you guys can check it out right there. Let me see. It'll be a little bit tricky here because I don't know how much room I've got. <laughs> okay, there we go. I was able to do it. All right. Might have to darken that up just a little bit so you guys can maybe see a little bit of the... Uh, 
the anime matrix design right there but overall uh, you'll see you've got very large massive of course um, heat sink design on here so this is a full C heat pipe so that means that there's actually a centered heat pipe that goes from this portion to this portion to this portion uh, and these are large massive uh, heat sinks which of course extend into the entirety of the IO shroud so in terms of the overall uh, stability uh, of this VRM, uh, whether it's stock or going to be overclocked, you 100% don't have to worry. This board is going to be super cool, uh, super reliable in that respect. So very, very performant based VRM design, as well as a very performant thermal solution. So in terms of the overall power configuration, this is going to be a 24 plus one, 105 amp power stages. Um, it also has microfine alloy chokes and 10K rated capacitors. Keep in mind that on all the ROG Maximus boards, they will have a higher end power delivery design than the ROG Strix boards um, because they will also offer not only higher performing uh, number of power stages, right, uh, but the overall components themselves are higher end. So uh, that is something to just be mindful of. In terms of the uh, connectors right here, there's dual 8 pin EPS, but we do have the Proco power connectors. That means that they're a thicker gauge. So they actually have better temperature performance. They have higher current level handling. So um, even if you only use one, it actually would have much better performance than just a single one. Um, but you also get better thermal balance so you do want to ideally use both of them. Uh, this board right over here, it's a little bit harder to see, but underneath there, there is still what is called the WB sensor. Um, you'll see it's this little header right here. This is pretty cool. We don't yet now have any confirmation from water block partners that we will have a block partner that will use the WB sensor. But if they do, and that connects in on the motherboard, essentially it means that it can uh, do things like um, leak detection. Um, it can also go ahead and monitor things like inlet and outlet and flow uh, for your custom water cooling loops and things along those lines. Uh, of course, four dim slots, you've got multimeter contact points. This is the dim.2 slot where, of course, you can install this guy right here. So this is the dim.2 adding card. Uh, I've gone ahead and just removed it here for reference, but that's where you can install one M.2 SSD. And then on the other side, you'll have another M.2 SSD. This board will support up to five M.2 SSDs that will be supported on here. Um, I've gone ahead and removed the bottom just for kind of a little bit more visibility so if you want to see there at the bottom so you pull it up you'll see right here you've got two more slots and then underneath this large heat sink there's another so that's the three so essentially two are going to be right here and then you're going to get uh three so one right here another right there and another right there. And this is a what's called dual heatsink design. So on all the higher end ROG Maximus boards, this will be another differentiation point is that you'll have a thermal pad and a heatsink for the top side, and then you'll have a thermal pad and a heatsink for the underside, right? And so the main reason why is because as you go to larger and larger density M.2 SSDs, you might have NAND that's gonna be on the front and on the back, especially as we start getting to now the four, eight, 16 terabyte M.2 SSDs um, and PCI Gen 5, uh, you're gonna have more heat. Um, so that's also why this heat sink is so massive on the PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD slot. Uh, there's that color display that's also on there. There's that nice kind of cool little RGB edge lighting that is also present on the motherboard. Uh, you do, of course, on all pretty much almost most of the motherboards that we're going to be showing. So even on the Tough Gaming series, you'll see that we do have the Q release design. That is, um, you know, not something super new. If somebody wants to see it demoed, let me know and I can demo it for you. But if you're not aware of it, essentially, it is a button that will allow you to easily eject the graphics card. So once the graphics card is installed, you don't have to worry about accessing any type of uh, onboard um ejection button, right, uh, that would normally be kind of be blocked right here, especially with these larger heat sinks. You just depress this button and it will allow you to go ahead and eject the card. As you see right here, if you look at this, you'll see that it triggers uh, the actual PCIe express retention mechanism itself, right? And so that's what allows it to go ahead and work, right? So that is going to be another differentiation point. Um, now, looking at the right side of the board, we see that we've course got all the right uh, connectors, right, right angle in terms of design. You've got an ARGB header right here. This actually splits out with a cable to allow for easier cable routing. So this board will give you a little uh, cable that will go ahead and connect to two additional ARGB headers, water pump header, chassis fan headers, power header. Now, right here, you see PD power. And so the PD power, of course, is also going to be connected to that 20 gigabits internal connector. So the cool thing about that is that, of course, if you have the PD power, which is a six pin PCI Express. This connector will work up to 60 watts in terms of providing uh, quick charge for plus, all right? But one that is a little bit harder to see right here is you see this says TB4, right? So there's actually a header that is on this board 
right there. Um, and let's see if we can get it right there. Yeah, that's an internal Thunderbolt 4 header. So there are going to be chassis that are going to be coming to the market. They will actually have a front panel Thunderbolt connectivity support. And so that is another kind of differentiation point there on the extreme board. So you don't have just the 20 gigabits connector there. You also have the front Thunderbolt connector. Okay. So that is going to be another upgrade. Um, then we move, of course, into the legacy USB connectors right there, uh, radiator fan grouping connectors, and then SATA ports. Um, so you got quite a bit of additional options that are available to you. Okay. And uh, if I go back over there to the uh, USB, let me go ahead and see right there if I can get that uh, to be in focus. There you go. So those two, you have dual front USB 3. So if you've got a chassis like the ROG Helios, the Helios has dual front USB 3 and it has type C. So it has five actually front high speed ports. You could connect all of those, right? So two legacy USB 3, and then you've also got the internal USB type C, right? So all of those are gonna be present on there, right? Um, in case I missed it at the top, I know probably nobody missed it, right? But there's, of course, a debug LED. There's the start button. Then there's the flex key. The flex key, you can map from different functions, right? You can do different stuff with it. I like usually mapping it for what's called safe boot, which is kind of like a clear CMOS, but without having to clear the whole CMOS, I can just reset frequency. Um, you've got your water cooling zone headers down here at the bottom. So this is going to be for dedicated flow uh, monitoring as well as temperature inlet and outlet monitoring. Um, you've got more fan headers. You also have dedicated dual BIOS. So there's actually a true dual BIOS that's on this motherboard, meaning that you could run like, you know, one BIOS on uh, one uh, ROM and then another BIOS on another ROM and you can actually switch between the two. Uh, then you have had some OC centric buttons that are going to be down here uh, for some additional kind of clock adjustments. I'll talk about those in a little bit, but they're not super critical unless probably you're going to be really interested in benchtop overclocking or kind of LN2 overclocking. USB 2 headers right there. Um, you've got some, of course, switches right here that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, those are going to be kind of, again, OC-centric kind of basic switches. And then your HD audio connector, which is going to be all the way over here. And then lastly, uh, on the audio side, right, this has the Supreme FX audio design, which is going to be this section right here. You can't see it too much because it's covered, um, but that has the ES Saber DAC and AMP, the shielded isolated audio codec, right? And then, of course, the audio grade capacitors that are on there, right? And we'll take a look back again on the rear I Oh, just to kind of recap essentially everything that's on there. But that is the extreme board in terms of kind of just a little bit of a visual tour on there. Um, let me go ahead and bring up back that slide to just quickly recap over the um, kind of the design elements that are going to be on there again. So Again, big upgrades that you see right there is you, the Maxima series here. It's going to be that Thunderbolt 4, um, the most extensive I.O., that AX411, right, which is going to give you that double connect technology, the integrated front Thunderbolt header, which is also going to be on the motherboard. That's going to be pretty rare. You won't generally see that in terms of that, that edge lighting, which is also going to be present. And then the audio codec, again, remember on the Maximus board, uh, the Extreme, as well as on the Hero, you're going to have the ESS Sabre DAC, the latest 32-bit uh, version of the um, ESS Sabre quad DAC. Okay. Uh, three ARGB headers that are going to be on there, but keep in mind this board does also come included with this guy. Let me go ahead and just show it right here. Um, yeah, I can show it. Uh, let me just put these side by side here. The board will also come in the box with this, which is going to come uh, included standard, which will be the ARGB fan controller hub. So this little hub will allow you to attach additional, essentially, fans to the motherboard as well. So the motherboard is already going to have tons of chassis fan headers. But if you even want to add more and more ARGB devices, uh, you can go ahead and connect, essentially, those three additional ARGB devices and those three additional fans. Uh, it does require SATA power to additionally power to that. And then it connects via an internal USB 2 header. But that comes inside the box. So oftentimes reviewers and, and uh, even users will forget that this is kind of included. There's a lot of extra stuff that comes with RG motherboards in the box. So you really don't want to discount them because it does add to the feature set and the functionality of the product, right? So that does come included with the Extreme. All right, and uh, let me go ahead and bring this up right here quickly. So there, uh, Extreme will also come with this little accessory right here. So let me go ahead and just show this to you here. And um, 
you do also have what is called the Voltition. Um, this will also be on the Apex motherboard. Essentially, it's kind of like a basic USB-based oscilloscope um, where you can have really advanced, essentially, capabilities to be able to monitor how your system is working in relation to voltage. So RG Maximus boards already have a more advanced type of voltage design uh, for essentially voltage detection, which is called differential dissense monitoring, which is more advanced and more accurate. Um, so if you care kind of about seeing that information the more accurately without jumping into kind of a multimeter then uh, you know that is going to be an inherent benefit of a maximus board over let's say an rog strix board or a tough gaming motherboard or a prime motherboard but for users that even want more precise um, and uh, more responsive kind of measurement then you can go over to the voltition and the voltition will allow you to either attach it internally or you can actually connect it externally and then bring it up on something like a laptop and so if you were to do that then there's the software ui interface so um, let's go ahead and actually show you what that would look like like here this is actually the ui where you can actually see you can bring up kind of the voltage data uh, you can go ahead and log that information you have it entirely available to you so it's really cool it's broken down really cleanly so you can go ahead and see this so if you really kind of want to dial things in see where things might be kind of dropping where you might be able to kind of tune for a little bit more efficiency take for instance or to improve its stability that's a really cool element of the voltition um, and here uh, I have, I think, a little bit of a video I can show you kind of just how kind of you can see the um, reporting information kind of work, right? So. So right here, you can see where you can go ahead and make the adjustments. You can read all the values, right? You can also have it respond to trigger points as well. So it's a really cool tool. I, I actually like using it um, when I'm doing some of my benchtop testing, uh, but again, you know, if you're somebody that's not super crazy about overclocking, right, in terms of getting into the kind of the nitty and gritty, it's not something you have to use. Of course, the board does also feature Asus AIC technology to make overclocking really, really easy for you. So if you just want kind of a one click option that's going to be easy, effective and reliable, then no worries. We're going to have you taken care of with Asus AIC. But this being the extreme board, we do like to be able to provide kind of these additional options for users to be able to have more granularity, more control to be able to kind of evolve uh, the overall experience when it comes to performance tuning. So lastly here, before I get ready to go here into the hero, um, just as this little tour down here at the bottom. So you're going to see that you've got a range of kind of different buttons at the bottom right here. You've got BCLK buttons, uh, which you can go ahead and use. BCLK adjustment can be beneficial sometimes for just bumping up the clock frequency a little bit more. Um, maybe you're running into kind of that you can't fully get into a bin that might be achievable by adjusting the multiplier. So sometimes you would adjust the uh, ratio, right, the multiplier, and then you would also adjust the BCLK, and that in combination will allow you to have even a little bit kind of more performance, right? So um, you have essentially these buttons that you can do that, but you can, of course, also do that within the UEFI environment. Um, LN2 mode, I won't, I won't touch on. Slow mode is also going to be really related to LN2. The probit is going to be, like I said there, for voltage measuring points. Um, again, also, this RSVD switch is also going to be really only for the LN2 grouse to extreme overclocking. Um, the retry button, the bio switch, and the safe mode button, these I would say are going to be more useful to standard overclockers. So users that just kind of want to be able to have a little bit more control and granularity. Um, so if you want essentially just more options when it comes to kind of tweaking and tuning, you can see that the extreme is really giving you a huge number of options when it comes to this, right? All right. So um, that should pretty much, I think, take care of most of the items that I wanted to be able to go ahead and touch on here. Um, I do show you this, maybe this little bit of exploded view. So you can actually see again where I was talking about there's that full uh, C-shaped heat pipe that's in there along with those large, massive VRM heat sinks, right? And then, of course, that ultra-performant uh, uh, VRM design that is going to be present on the board. And directly underneath that primary course, OLED Live Dash display, you'll see right there that you, of course, have that other, that third uh, onboard PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD slot, right? So that covers uh, pretty much the extreme in all its uh, kind of variations, right? So that does kind of cover you uh, in terms of all the key points and and uh, I didn't note it here, but it is fairly self-explanatory that this board does also have um, the Q-latch design. So, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, Q-latch. So if we go back quickly to the motherboard, right? If you're looking for a simple and easy way, if you guys maybe are coming from an older motherboard, right? Um, 
and you know you haven't installed an M.2 SSD or you know you've installed it on the old sensitive configuration, the great thing about the Q-latch design, right, is you can just angle in the drive, just put it down, and then you just lock it in, right? So super, super easy, super, super simple. But you're gonna pretty much see that on just about almost all the motherboards, right? So um, nothing new in that regard, right? So a nice kind of simple clean way to benefit from this. And in case anybody's wondering about the DAC number on this generation, this is going to be the ESS9218, right? And uh, all the aspects of measurement in terms of the THD, the signal noise ratio, all have been improved from even the prior generation. So tonality, detailing, and sound stage is an overall better experience, right? So overall, pretty sweet in terms of just the overall upgrades. This board does also give you 10G um, and 2.5G, where most of the other boards were only going to be looking at 2.5G based networking, um, so do keep that in mind. Um, the uh, OLED Live Dash display, I do want to show you a little bit right here in terms of some of the things that you can see in terms of kind of the customization element. You can have, of course, uh, like I said, voltage, you can have a frequency information, you can actually have different types of elements that you plug in from the Army Crate software. There's a lot of customization that you can show. You actually can give you BIOS updating information, and you can have custom images or animations that are going to be present on there. So a lot of essentially flexibility control to have it serve as a little bit more maybe of a functional element as opposed to kind of a more aesthetic aesthetic element. And you do also have debug readout information. So if let's say it's going through DRAM training, you'll see actually postcode information that we displayed to you there as well. So um, it also, it doesn't note that there, but hardware monitoring would include like debugging. Okay. Okay. So I think that covers everything that I wanted to touch on onto the extreme. Let me go ahead and see. I know uh, we might have some questions that have kind of come up on there and uh, I will also, uh, let me bring up here, uh, pricing just to kind of confirm everybody and again availability um, let me go ahead and see if I can double check on that for you guys so give me one second and I will see if I can double check on that but uh, pricing for the extreme should be 999. So that is the, gonna be the price point for the extreme. And then the next one that we'll take a look at will be the hero, okay? All right, so that covers us there. Let me go ahead and see uh, any questions that might've come up there. Uh, somebody's asking, is there any chance for future DTX boards? You know, there's always a possibility that we may do something. Right now, we have no plans for it. Um, DTX is interesting, but the reality is that small form factor is a very niche segment of the market. It already takes a considerable amount of design and effort to do high performance mini ITX based boards. And even going into a further, more customized uh, PCB, like a DTX based offering, is even more complicated and more time consuming and more expensive, right? And uh, I think that right now, it's just there's not necessarily the demand to justify that. Um, um, you know, but as always, we'll, you know, we'll monitor feedback from the community. We'll see, you know, what their thoughts are. Um, I think that the Dash I this generation is a great option uh, for small form factor enthusiasts, but no plans right now in terms of a mini DTX space board. Okay. So, um, Braithorn is asking, I think, about maybe the um, uh, LAN configuration. Again, this is a 10G based LAN with 2.5 gigabit LAN. And keep in mind that anybody that wants to add higher speed LAN, if the board only has 2.5G, of course, you can easily add a 10G adding card into that. Uh, Ken K was asking, is the DAC above the competition? Most boards, you won't actually find an ESS Sabre DAC that's going to be present on the motherboard. You're going to probably find um, just the standard uh, audio codec. So you kind of have to compare that. There's also some differences in terms of actually layout um, and actually how you do some of the filtering, um, whether you maybe have a pre-input power regulator. There's a lot of things. So when you talk about audio design, you can't just measure component to component. You have to really talk about the totality of the design implementation. Um, you know. It's a little bit, you know, um, you know, bias on our part to say it, but you know, we were the ones that designed 
isolated audio designs before any other manufacturer and we have the longest history of doing it. We're also one of the only motherboard manufacturers that has a full dedicated audio division that really is quite rich and established. Um, so I think that you know, when we talk about the overall design specification support that we have here, we really do think it's an outstanding um, solution. But you know, if we compare this still to a discrete option, so if you bought like a Zonar add-in card, right? Um, or if you got you know some form of a USB external audio solution, right? Those would still be higher performing because you are still ultimately going to be constrained by the cost and the design limitations in terms of what you can fit onto the board and having to kind of fight against everything you're doing on a motherboard versus a, a discrete component, right? Um, but I would say that for many users, the overall audio experience here is going to be a very nice quality audio experience, whether it's going to be in music, movies, or games, right? Okay. Um, Somebody's asking about Rampage series. Rampage series are actually for uh, the HEDT platform. So things like the X99, X299 base chipset, things like that. Um, there will be, of course, a refresh for this later on in the next year where you'll see Sapphire Rapids, um, but nothing to disclose at this time. Okay, so I think that probably covers that. So let's go ahead and just get ready to jump into the uh, Hero motherboard, okay? So that is gonna be the, again, the Extreme. I'll go ahead and show that one one more time right here before we get over to the Hero, all right? So let's maybe do a little bit of a side-by-side. -side. We'll put the Extreme, although it's gonna look a little bit, uh, oh no, I did kind of put the heat sink back on there, so you kind of can see it a little bit there with there. And get one more stand and we'll put it side by side to the hero. And we'll then take a look at the Apex guys. We'll go a little bit probably faster on the hero because most of the features will be pretty similar there. So there you guys can see uh, the two side-by-side -side boards. They look fantastic. Here's the hero, here's the extreme. The extreme of course is the ATX, uh, the hero is not, excuse me, the Extreme is going to be ATX and the Hero will be ATX. Um, you'll also see a little bit of a difference. The Extreme, I think, looks great when it's not on in terms of RGB lighting, but you really want to kind of take advantage of the anime display matrix, right? The Hero, though, we specifically designed this actual material to actually have like kind of a chrome line accent. So it really does have a great design aesthetic, even when it doesn't have any RGB lighting enabled on the motherboard. But when you do have the RGB lighting, it does look quite cool because it has uh, what's called a multi-layered design, which is called our polymo lighting design. Um, and I'll show that, of course, when we take a closer look at the board, right? But you can see the overall kind of cool design that it has there. And it will actually sequence through a few different designs and that's the big benefit between kind of the ROG Strix series. The ROG Strix series has one ID design, it's a fixed acrylic. Um, with the polymo lighting, you can actually just see right there how it actually changed to a different design. So it has a little bit of a different design aesthetic which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the Hero, okay? Let me go ahead and just remove this really here, really quick. All right, and I'm gonna throw this one down here on our secondary camera. Bring the Apex back out here, guys. Okay. And we'll get ready to jump in there into the Hero. And give me one sec to just put this uh, extreme away here in the box. All right, cool. All right, so that uh, covers the extreme. So now let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the Hero board. And this is my kind of personal favorite within, uh, I think, our lineup. Although the Apex is definitely pretty, pretty tempting in terms of the overall kind of the, the features, the functions, uh, the design, and the aesthetic is really, really nice as well, right? Okay, so let me just bring this up here.
So again, just as a quick recap, right? Uh, we just went over on the extreme and now we're gonna go over to the hero and then we'll touch on the apex. So here for the Hero, uh, we're gonna see still very, very high in specification support, right? So uh, you got four USB right there, two more USB, two more USB, so that's gonna be eight. Then you're gonna have 12. So 12 USB ports that are gonna be on the rear, uh, clear CMOS, USB BOS flashback, HDMI. That is HDMI 2.1. I think somebody asked previously also on the extreme, is it HDMI 2.1? I don't think that's necessarily relevant because I don't think that many people are going to be using HDMI 2.1 bandwidth for integrated display graphics. But if you are, hey, you've got HDMI 2.1 that's going to be on there. Um, Thunderbolt 4 is going to be present on this board. Uh, so you do also, of course, keep in mind that from a bandwidth perspective, you've got 5 gigabits, 10 gigabits. Uh, then you also have, of course, your 40 gigabits, right? So you've got tons of high speed based uh, connectivity that's gonna be present to you on the Hero, right? So very, very feature rich in terms of the overall IO specification, right? Um, 2.5G networking, as opposed to remember the Extreme, the Extreme has 10G and 2.5G, and then you've got Wi-Fi 6E. Now keep in mind, this board does not have the AX411, so that's gonna be essentially both Wi-Fi 6E, but the AX411 will also support that double connect technology and the band aggregation technology, where this one, essentially, you still just get the fastest Wi-Fi you can pretty much get with Wi-Fi 6E support, but you don't have that ability to have simultaneous bands being connected through the controller. So I couldn't connect it, let's say, for gaming, and and then have the other band connected for like browsing or for uh, downloading another file for streaming something in for different types of functionality that will be made available to you right um, audio solution is still going to be the same audio solution so i'm not going to recap the supreme effects audio design it's the same alc audio codec along with the ess saber dac and amp implementation so they're exactly the same there um, for dim support is pretty much going to be the same in terms of what you can expect so again you, it will be realistic to be able to see that you can achieve uh, ddr5 7000 mt uh, for, I think, a good amount of the actual memory controllers right here um, and even faster speeds. You don't start to see the trail off in terms, uh, probably until you start to break about 74 to about 7800 where you have to have a stronger memory controller. But again, we'll talk a bit more about overclocking in tomorrow's dedicated overclocking stream. Um, in terms of the M.2 configuration, right, you have three M.2 SSDs that are supported natively on the motherboard, right? Um, they're all Gen 4 for the motherboard natively. And then through the Hyper M.2 add-in card, the Hyper M.2 add-in card will give you one Gen 5 and then one Gen 4 slot. So you can support up to five M.2 SSDs on the Hero, right? But do keep in mind that essentially there's no native Gen 5 on board. It is done through the Hyper M.2 add-in card. Um, this board though does support the ability to have dual PCI Express Gen 5, just like the Extreme. So if you did wanna go ahead and have maybe a slimmer, um, you know, uh, M.2 add-in card, card for PCI Gen 5 support, you could go ahead and do that from that secondary slot. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you could kind of approach it if you didn't want to use our very nice included M.2 hyper adding card. Um, and I will show you that guys. I, I have the box right here so I can go ahead and show it to you what it looks like. Um, the polymo lighting display, which we already noted, and then kind of all the similar kind of connections that we already detailed. So I'm not going to go over all of those uh, because they're pretty much similar to the extreme, right? So let me go ahead and uh, reconnect this. We'll just take a quick visual look at this and then we'll get ready to go into the Apex. And I'm also going to go ahead and show you the Hyper M.2 adding card. So give me one second here. So we'll do that. And pretty much what I'm pulling out right here, guys, is gonna just be to be able to show you the included card. So if you wanna know what that kind of looks like. All right, here you guys go. So this is the Hyper M.2 add-in card. It's very nice, it's quite dense. This whole thing is a large uh, heat sink. So let's go ahead and um, just go to our second camera right here. We can see the Hero's got that really cool polymo lighting display design that's gonna be on there. Um, 
that is the Hyper M.2 add-in card. You'll see that there's kind of one slot right there and there's another slot right there. So one's for PCI Express Gen 5 and one's PCI Express Gen 4. And like I said, that whole thing is a heat sink that's on there. So it's quite massive. Um, we'll slot into one of the slots that are gonna be there on the board and you'll be good to go. Uh, if you want to use that, if not, like I said, you're fine. You don't have to. Uh, this board also, of course, has the Q release design. It also has the dual M.2 um, heatsink design where you have one on the rear and you have one on the top side. So again, you're covered in that regard, right? Again, there's three M.2 SSD slots that are natively on the motherboard right there. This one also does have a large uh, VRM heatsink, right? And also it has a heat pipe there. So don't um, be concerned in terms of any type of thermal considerations, right? This is gonna keep it really cool, really quiet um, in terms of, you know, uh, all the kind of thermal considerations, right? Uh, for, for the power delivery structure, for the compared to the extreme, this is a 20 plus one versus a 24 plus one, um, 90 amp power stages, right? They're SPS power stages, 10K rated capacitors, also microfine alloy inductors, right? Again, these will all be higher end than what you're gonna be on, even on the ROG Strix board. You have the dual EPS that also are gonna be the ProCool power connectors. Um, you've got all those fan headers that we talked about. Um, debug led all that good stuff uh one thing that i do want to go ahead and touch on here it's going to be all the way down at the bottom so let me go ahead and just touch on it right there is right here is this little switch this is pretty interesting so this is what we call the pcie alteration mode switch so this will allow you to go ahead and toggle into different modes um, for the actual pci express operations so if you're using something like a riser cable um, in some situations depending on the quality of the riser cable um, and some other factors you can actually run into initialization issues so being able to actually switch this into a different pci express mode the benefit of it is is that it can actually help to improve the post experience because you can actually force it to be in let's say PCI Express Gen 3 mode versus PCI Express Gen 4 mode. So that can be beneficial in terms of instead of you having to kind of pull out the ribbon cable and reinstall the graphics card or go to integrated graphics, kind of change the whole situation just to get the system to post, you can use this switch. You also have the ability uh, within the UEFI that you can change this switch to control fan speed. So if you wanted to, you could actually have it be like at full fan speed or like uh, medium fan speed. So it's kind of like a little cool hardware like fan, fan control functionality which is kind of interesting so pci mode and fan mode functionality from this switch okay uh, your argb headers that are going to be on the board your two internal usb2 um, and do also keep in mind that this board will also still uh, maintain let me see if i can show it to you very closely um, i don't know if i can show it to you it might be yeah i don't have the screws on there um so but i was just going to show you of course you still have the q release a q latch design there for the m.2 ssds um and you're going to be good to go uh you still also have the 60 watt charging also on this board right for the internal 20 gigabits USB C header so that is going to be the hero and again you can see kind of the little poly mode display lighting changing it up right there right looks pretty cool All right, so that is going to be the Maximus Z790 Hero. Uh, let me see if we have any questions on there before we get over to the extreme, okay? Yeah, so somebody was saying, um, I already noted that, that yes, it is a 20 plus one. Um, so again, the extreme is 24 plus one, and then the hero is gonna be 20 plus one. The extreme has 105 amp power stages. The hero is 90 amp power stages. They're both SPS power stages. Uh, they're also both using microfine alloy inductors and 10K rated capacitors. So these will be higher performing than like the Strix. Take for instance, like the Strix is using 18 plus one versus the hero, which is a 20 plus one. Um, um, and then 90 amps in terms of the post power stages and their SPS base, but they won't be 10K rated capacitors and they won't be microfine alloy inductors. So regardless of how you evaluate the VRM, all the VRMs are very performant. Even if we go down to tough gaming, you're gonna run a 3900K, no problems. It's not an issue on any of the motherboards. They're all very high performant VRM designs. But if you kind of want, quote unquote, just even higher level of, um, headroom and you want more efficiency from the VRM design, then uh, the ROG Maxima series is of course gonna be the best for you, okay? All right, so that is gonna be the hero right there. 
Um, so a developers, why did Asus include? Actually, we used to do backplates in the past, and it just kind of was one of those things that um, you know we just didn't feel that it was needed, especially because when we first actually uh, implemented a backplates on motherboards, it was because there was actually more commonly discrete um, MOSFETs and drivers that you would find in terms of the VRM design. So in terms of the overall VRM design that you would have on the motherboard, there was actually more of a need to kind of sometimes have direct contact with components that would be on the rear of the motherboard for additional cooling benefit. But as we moved to more consolidated kind of power stages, there was less and less value to do so. So it wasn't necessarily as critical. Um, and here, um, you know, just added an additional kind of premium and we saw that some people wanted to see it reintroduced. So we reintroduced it back over on this. Now it does have the benefit, of course, that it can help to be a little bit nicer uh, to hold, of course, because you don't have to worry about kind of underside pin or anything like that. Um, and if you go really, really heavy on the motherboard, um, you can get a little bit less torsion. Um, so that actually allows you to have kind of a more stable kind of solidified experience from the board perspective. So that's just, a, it's just a premium upgrade. So that was the kind of just main factor of just kind of going, hey, can we maybe also help to improve that area? We know a lot of people already had a great experience already with the Z690 Hero. There was never any issues in terms of torsion or variance or anything like that, but it was just an area that we could go ahead and improve upon, right? So. Um, H2O computers, yes, I will be talking about the MSRP on the Apex in a little bit, but I think I already noted it in the very beginning, the, a the Apex will be essentially the same price as the Hero. So it's pretty much just pick the board that you like the most because they're both gonna cost the same, right? So, uh, and the price point is 629 uh, for the actual either Apex or for the Hero, okay? So let me go ahead and quickly just put away the Hero and uh, we will then get over here to the Apex. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put these two side by side just so you can see them. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get our Apex board. And the lighting design is a little bit different on the Apex as it is on the Hero. It's not uh, the polymo lighting, but it is very nice. Go ahead and clean that up a little bit. Okay. All right, so there you go. It's kind of, which one do you, which one? Everybody in the chat, what do you think? I, it's really hard because they both are fantastic looking motherboards. I don't think one looks better than the other. They just look both great. It's really just which kind of board that you really like. Um, you know, they both are really just fantastic looking. I really do like this kind of chrome effect that exists on the, uh, the black hero though, which I think is really, really cool. But uh, let me go ahead and show you just kind of light up what the kind of the board looks like there. Okay, so let me go ahead and we'll go right there. So there you can see that's with the polymo lighting on the Hero. And then we're going to go ahead and light it up here on the, uh, on the Apex. If I, had, I don't remember if I have a secondary adapter. If I have a secondary adapter, I could connect both of them. Oh, I think I might actually. Okay. Yep, I can light them both up, but light light them both up at the same time, guys. Give me one second here. All right, so there you can see on the Apex, it's got a little bit of a kind of cool uh, lighting effect. We have it right now hi hidden in here inside of kind of the I.O., right? And then you'll also see down there at the bottom right here, there's another little RG, ROG LED. And then also on the PCB right here, there's a little bit of a cool lighting design right there, right? So they both look fantastic. I think that they're really, really cool. Um, I don't know which one to pick. Again, uh, let me know what you guys think in terms of both of them. I think that they both look fantastic, right? So let's get ready to go ahead and look at the Apex uh, a little bit closer. So give me one sec to pop this hero back in and we will go from there. All right. 
right, that is going to be the hero. And again, uh, pricing six twenty nine for the hero and six twenty nine for the apex. So they will both be coming in at the same price point. Okay, perfect. All right, so we've got that all set up. Let's move over our Apex board here. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring up a, a couple of images just on the Apex to take a little bit of a closer look at it. So you guys can see it just a little bit more closely here in some of the images. So here you can see uh, it's got a really, really cool design aesthetic, right, in terms of the overall white PCB. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the white, coarse, and silver accents that you have on there still follows the same design language in terms of the Maximus boards. Again, the biggest difference we'll see is that it's going to be a two DIM board versus a four DIM based motherboard, right? You do have the DIM.2 add in card. You still get the Q release based design. You'll see a little bit more of kind of right angle connectors because it's going to be a little bit more common sometimes to use this in a bench top testing configuration. So, because of that, we're going to go ahead and go right angle on terms of some of those connectors, uh, but you also still see similar design elements that will be present here on the Apex, right? So if we uh, go over here, right, you're gonna see that you've got uh, one chassis fan header right here. Uh, you're also gonna have uh, the white, which will be a full speed chassis fan header, this dual CPU power connectors, right? ARGB header, ARGB header, and debug LED, uh, AIO pump header, Right here, start and flex key buttons. Uh, you then have, of course, your uh, monitoring points that are going to be present to you right there. Uh, we'll have, of course, the overclocking level controls, very similar to the extreme board. You then have your internal USB type C, another fan connector, right angle uh, USB 3 connector, uh, 60 watt supplemental charger right there. Excuse me, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, PCI Express power connector, six SATA ports, and then you're also going to have another uh, high speed fan header. Um, and then you've got your ARGB headers right there. This board uh, won't have uh, Thunderbolt on it like what we saw on the Hi Hero or the Extreme, um, but you do have the Thunderbolt header that's on there. So if you want to add the Thunderbolt add in card, you can do that. And then you also have another secondary USB 3 internal header. So it still has dual USB 3 internal headers along with. Uh, the internal type C connector. So you still get plenty of internal IO. And this one also does have right here, the integrated power, excuse me, uh, bio switch, because it has full independent uh, ROMs, just like the extreme board. Okay. And two internal USB two headers, another chassis fan header, and then the dedicated water cooling zone header. So if you want to do the temperature inlet and outlet and flow monitoring, that is going to be present on this one as well. Okay. So uh, let's just go through a little bit here of a flyover. And so taking a look at the rear I.O., rear I.O., you've got clear CMOS, you have BIOS, uh, legacy PSU, uh, PS2 connections. Some people might ask, well, why would you do this? This is, again, not really for the normal user. This is going to be for the overclocking enthusiast, where PS2 is going to be a benefit, specifically in their certain overclock uh, configurations. Uh, you then got your five gigabits USB connectors, right? So these are going to be four five gigabits, then you've got four 10 gigabits, and then you have 20 gigabits, right? And another 10 gigabits. So you have four 8, 10. So 10 USB ports, still tons of high speed USB ports right there. The 20 gigabit connector, 2.5 gigabit. Uh, that's going to be, of course, that Intel i226 and then Wi Fi 6E multi channel audio with uh, the optical out. Now keep in mind the Apex will not come with the ES Sabre DAC. It will come with the ALC 4080 audio codec that'll be on there with audio grade capacitors, the isolated audio design. You'll still get the full Sonic Studio 3 software suite, but it does not have the ES. 
ESS Saber DAC and AMP built on board. So you can start to see some of the differences between the Hero and the um, Apex. So if you care more about maybe higher gain audio and you have uh, analog based headphones, you want Thunderbolt 4. Maybe you want that little bit more advanced uh, lighting display, the Polymo lighting, right? Uh, those are all starting to be elements that you're going to have on the Hero where you don't have those on the Apex, okay? So that's where you're starting to see, uh, you know, design differences, okay? Um, that's the included, of course, antenna that you're going to have on there. And uh, that should pretty much be it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up here the, give me one second. Um, we're going to put it onto the secondary camera. And I'm also going to pull off the heat sink there just so you can actually take a little bit of a closer look right there. Now, this board will be a little bit more like the extreme. Let me actually darken that up just a little bit. Okay, um, this board will be a little bit more like the extreme when we talk about the actual uh, heat sink design here on this one because this is actually a C shaped heat uh, heat pipe. So this is like the extreme where we have a heat pipe that goes from this stage to this stage to this stage, right? So there's a large heat sink right here, heat sink right here, and there's a heat sink right here. And this heat sink extends over into this section, right? Um, so this is going to be like more like the extreme than the hero, where the hero has the two stage. Um, excuse me, the two stage heat pipe design and, and then heat sink design, right? A lot of pause caps right there for of course that advanced uh, filtering that you're gonna have available to you. Uh, the dim dot two, so the dim dot two will also similarly be the same color. So you'll go ahead and have that uh, benefit to be able to go ahead and add your M.2 SSDs there on the board. Okay, um, go ahead and see if we move this a little bit down. Take a little bit of closer look at the actual design. You have the Q release ejection mechanism right there that's going to be the same as before, right? And let's go ahead and remove this right here. I would love to see 90 degree 24 pins. So um, I can tell you the reason why we don't do it is because it doesn't make sense. Uh, the reality is, is that when you start to add 24 pin to a lot of motherboards, especially into the ATX based motherboards, you run into a much higher level of mechanical conflict issues. So some users say that they like it, but the reality is that when actually it's tested in a broader segment of chassis, it actually presents more issues. So um, we actually can go back more than a decade and we've had motherboards that we've done right angle based connectors, but the reality is that they just don't tend to be more mechanically suited um, to reducing uh, issues when it comes to interoperability and compatibility when you install them in different types of chassis. So that's the reason why we tend to not favor right angle connectors on our designs. Um, you can see large, of course, heat sink right there, thermal pad right there, uh, thermal pad for that drive. You still have, of course, the Q latch design mechanism right there. So you can see right here in terms of the M.2 SSD support, uh, one M.2 SSD, then you've got another M.2 SSD right there. And then you'll have two right there. So this board board will support up to four M.2 based SSDs. So again, DIM.2 will give you four, excuse me, two right here. And then you'll have one that's going to be underneath here. And then you're going to have this one right here. So that will give you your uh, four M.2 based SSDs, right? Now you can also see that really nice looking, of course, white PCB looks really clean in terms of the overall design aesthetic, right? Um, go ahead and just see here if there's anything else that I think that uh, is going to be very relevant for you guys in terms of be of interest that I didn't cover. So, so Supreme FX audio design here. Uh, I covered the Thunderbolt header. Uh, these switches right here, again, you don't need to worry about this switch right here. This is the RSVD switches. So these are just like the extreme board. I think I touched on this one already before, right? This is right here, the BIOS switch, right? If we take a look at the other side. Uh, so right here, this is gonna be your BCLK buttons right there. And then these are gonna be your OC switches as well. So nothing to kind of worry about on that regard, okay? All right, um, I think that takes care of that. Uh, and in case somebody is wondering on this one, I can go ahead and remove this one here quickly. So let me just go ahead and show you here. So this, uh, excuse me, right there, you can see that's that other M.2. So uh, one right underneath there, and you can see very large 
drive in terms of the heatsink for that uh, M.2 drive that would be installed right there. And that one is gonna be a uh, dual contact design, right? So you can see right there, you've got on the underside, you've got that thermal pad and you've got that thermal pad right there. So um, just like some of the other Maximus boards, right? Where we're giving you that thermal dissipation benefit from the underside and from the top side, you're still gonna get that present on here. Um, some of the users also, I think, will appreciate that this one, because it's got um, a large spacing between the primary slot and the other slot, these are going to be both PCI Express Gen 5, right? So that's kind of a hallmark on the extreme, the Apex and the Hero. That could be a benefit, again, depending on the permutations on how you maybe want to add in something like an add-in card or if you want to do PCI bifurcation support uh, on something along those lines. So do look at that if you're going to be considering that from kind of a, a benefit perspective, right? So. Okay, um, let me go ahead and just see if there's any other questions there on the Apex. I'm just gonna go ahead and put this heat sink back in place here. And hopefully, um, you know, you guys really like this uh, white apex you know we know that we've had a lot of people that have wanted to see that and since we don't also have the formula this generation uh, for z790 um, this is kind of the alternate offering to give you a white themed maximus series motherboard so uh, again um, you know the reality is we know that we have a lot of people that like to see kind of the white components and we have the broadest uh, ecosystem there's no other manufacturer that offers as many white components as, it, as we do um, but it is still a smaller share of the market and it's also a more challenging uh, product to produce in terms of the yield and consistency um, so definitely you know we look for your guys's feedback in terms of just the appreciation of the um, to support these products when we do put them out there in the market because the reality is if we don't see the adoption uh, for these then it, it, it becomes more challenging to justify you know uh, producing these right um, but that's also the why there's been such a consistency in terms of at least making um, you know the prime series and the RG strix uh, dash a series available is because we've continued to see very very strong adoption within those models so it doesn't mean that the apex will always be white now moving forward in the future this is a little bit of a kind of a test so this is why again we're looking hopefully for your feedback um, to see you know what you're kind of interested in there right okay so um, let me quickly just before I get over to the next boards here um, I think we're gonna go to RG Strix will be next but um, let me go ahead and just see what questions you guys there um, you guys have made white AIs before. Well, we didn't make before. We have them right now. We have the ROG Strix LC uh, series in white. So there's actually, they've, when they're even the updated series, um, the LC2, which is in white. Let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, so I can bring it here. Let me see if I can show you guys. And we do have that in... Um, and we also have the Ryu, the upcoming Ryu will be available in white also. So I know some people will be excited by that. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. So this is our one of our current white coolers. This is the ROG Strix LC2. So this is already fully compatible with 1700. Um, so Z690, Z790, 12th gen, 13th gen is fully compatible. So we have this in a 240 and a 360. And I have it right here. I'll be using this tomorrow. Ugh. But this guy will be, of course, the next generation AIO cooler from Asus. This is the brand new Ryu, which has the Anime Matrix um, pump housing display. So instead of kind of your square head, this will be the circular head, and this will have a cool kind of pixelated kind of graphics design like the Anime Matrix. And this is using the eighth gen Asetek based uh, pump design with a new larger actually plate. Um, there's some other cool design benefits. So this will actually be used for tomorrow's a uh, overclocking demo, um, but we will also be releasing this one in a white variant. So we will have a white variant in terms of two different colors, two different coolers. Uh, they will have available okay all right um, uh, let me go ahead and just see here on the question 
Yeah, uh, Paskowitz makes a great point there. Silver boards work well in white builds and are also fine with black builds. Yeah, actually, I, some of my favorite builds are what are called sometimes, like people call them panda builds, or I like to refer to it as a color blocking, which means that you can have black and white components. Um, black always serves as a great contrast for white, so um, it looks great in kind of either configuration if you want to mix and match the components, or if you want to go for a full kind of white aesthetic, we have you covered. The Helios comes in white. We have white power supplies. We have white coolers. We'll have white fans. We have white monitors, keyboards, mice, um, literally Every component that we make is white. Um, no, we don't have any plans to make a Ryujin in white, um, but you know, never know. We'll see. Uh, like I said, if we get enough feedback, maybe. Uh, let me just go ahead and see if there's any other questions uh, that kind of came up there before we get into the ROG Strix boards. Um, so ETA on this board, I don't have a concrete ETA for you. You'll probably have a little bit more information at the next week in terms of availability. I would expect these to all kind of be released at the same time frame for the new Pro Art and for the Tough Gaming DDR5. So we're probably going to be looking at at least maybe about uh, two to three weeks difference in terms of availability. So probably a little bit closer as we get into the beginning of November as opposed to um, you know, uh, this month right now, we're already, we kind of have the first wave of Z790 boards already av available. It'll be a little bit longer before we get to uh, the Pro Art motherboard. Um, the Extreme, which is getting ready to come out shortly, the Extreme should probably be available before the Apex and before the Pro Art and before the Tough Gaming board. Okay. Okay, um, don't think I see any questions uh, that we have there on in terms of any other points there on the Apex. So I'm gonna get ready to go ahead and uh, move that along to the Strix boards, okay? All right, if anybody has any other questions, let me know. Go ahead and get this one in the box here as well. All right, so. Maybe you should have kept that hero out just in case you guys wanted to see side by side, but I can do that in uh, normal images. But uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take out the ROG Strix board. For ROG Strix, we are going to have uh, three different models. So, excuse me, uh, four different models, what am I referring to? Uh, for ROG Strix, we will have the dash E, the dash F, the dash A, and the dash I, okay? And uh, if you guys, I didn't talk about too much because of course it's already uh, been communicated, but do keep in mind that all of the ROG boards do come of course with the uh, ASUS AI uh, OC technology, which uh, we'll probably have just a little bit of a demo there at the very end of this, just again, show you if you guys aren't familiar, but that essentially is the predictive technology that we have built into the UEFI, which uh, detects the CPU, detects the cooling solution, and then based on that, we'll automatically apply our machine learning model, right, of an actual overclock parameter, right? And the great thing is that that is based off of hundreds of samples that we test internally with many different types of CPU cooler configurations so that we can make sure that we align your actual overclock with your system's cooling performance. The better cooling the performance, the better the overall course overclock that you can have present. And we also have sliders that allow you to go for either more aggressive overclocking or more conservative overclocking. And you can, of course, use that as a baseline before you go into manual tuning. And all the boards that do support ASUS AIOC also support our new dynamic OC uh, cache switcher technology. And so that actually will give you the ability to actually adjust the cache um, so that it can actually take advantage of even a higher level of performance, especially under lightly threaded loads. Now the uh, overclocking the cache essentially will generally um, give you overall better performance, especially in lightly threaded loads, especially in their gaming, um, but it can lead to higher levels of instability and has more limitations when you go to more sustained multi-threaded workloads. And this is why we actually have this switcher technology because 
depending on the load, the current that you define, you can actually then target in that the overclocking comes into play under those light light workloads where the cache would be overclocked, but then it would actually go back down uh, when you're talking about a more non, excuse me, a, a more multi-threaded workload. So again, if you were maybe going from some using something like Photoshop or gaming, uh, but then all of a sudden you started doing Premiere, um, where you know one's going to be more lightly threaded and then it's going to be more one's going to be more multi-threaded. So let me go ahead and see. I think this is the is this the Strix board? Got some different boxes here, actually. Uh, let me take out the. I think I'll take out both the Tough Gaming and the RG Strix because then we can kind of put them side by side. And uh, the Tough Gaming, even though you guys previously saw the DDR4 Tough Gaming, you guys have not seen the DDR5 Tough Gaming. And this should be, I believe, our RG Strix. Yep. All right. Very cool. Okay, so let's uh, show you guys these two. We'll put them a little side by side so you can just kind of see how they look. I think they both look fantastic. So here is going to be the ROG Strix. This is the Dash E. It's got a really cool, just clean monochrome design aesthetic, which is what you know the ROG Strix series are known for. And pretty much all of the boards right now, even the Tough Gaming series, which have historically had maybe a little bit more of a design accent, um, you still have now pretty much a monochrome design aesthetic, right? So the Tough Gaming is really cool. It's, it looks fantastic. It's even a little bit more kind of a uh, monochrome than I think almost the RG Strix. So the RG Strix has a little bit of kind of a design accent that is present in the IO. And let's go ahead and light these two up. You can see these two and we're then going to go into the specs and kind of see what we have going on there. So tough gaming. Tough Gaming will be very, very subtle. It's literally a little bit of a LED lighting over here at the top, and then another little LED there at the bottom. So it's really gonna be, friends, if you are not a big fan of RGB, then you know Tough Gaming is a really, really great choice. Um, it still is a nice little accent there if you wanna have it in your build, but you don't have to worry about having a huge amount of lighting there. And here on the ROG Strix, you'll see that it has that really nice, fully illuminated little ROG eye that's there in the IO shroud. So as we saw there on the Extreme and on the Hero and on the Apex, those have, of course, the most RGB lighting on the motherboard, right? So if you want a little bit more of a design aesthetic, then those will be great choices for you. If you want something a little bit more kind of uh, refined there, then Tough Gaming. And then if you want something a little bit more edgy, ROG Strix. And the ROG Strix, as we get closer in the secondary cam, you'll see a lot more little kind of design accents that are on there because it tends to have a little bit more of an edgy design that we put on some of the um, iconography and some of the what we call cyber text. Uh, that you won't see on the ROG Maximus series. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, take a closer look here at the ROG Strix board. I'm gonna go ahead and set that tough gaming board down there. Okay, very cool. And let's uh, bring up here our ROG Strix. All right. <clears throat> and uh, let me go ahead and just show you, I think the, for, uh, the four boards uh, for ROG Strix, so, so you guys can kind of get a sense of this. Um, well, actually, I think here, let's first do this. I think this is a, a nice option is that we can go through and just show you the three boards from the gaming series. 
So before uh, we go there, here you can see the three different gaming series, right, that we have. So uh, we have Tough Gaming, we have ROG Strix, and then we have the Maximus series. So this is gonna be good, better, best. So the entry will be on the Tough Gaming side, the mid-range is going to be in the ROG Strix, and then in the highest-end enthusiast will be the ROG Maximus series. And um, just you know, for some general points as far as kind of differentiation, again, power delivery and overall components will be higher end on the Maximus compared to any one of these. They all feature high-performance teamed power stages on all of the motherboards. So the power delivery quality is going to be great, stable and reliable, whether it's stock or overclocked. But these will feature the highest performance power stages, the greatest number of power stages, 10K rated capacitors, microfine alloy inductors. The differential die sense voltage monitoring is also exclusive to Maximus here. Okay. Um, Supreme Effects Audio Design also is the only series that has the ESS Saber DAC. This uses the ALC4080, and then here we use the prior S1200 uh, series audio, um, but it's still fully isolated audio, and you still also get a DTS audio suite, but it's not as comprehensive as a Sonic Studio audio suite. Um, these also come with Game First Packet Priority software, and this comes with um, a more basic Turbo LAN application for packet priority optimization, right? Um, you get the Q release, Q release, and Q release on all the boards. Um, this one does not feature uh, up to the 60 watt charging, right? So you're gonna have up to uh, 30 watt that's gonna be on these boards, but you don't have the 60 watt charging that you would see like on Tough Gaming, on ROG Strix. Um, there'll also be uh, differences in terms of the IO, right? This is gonna have up to, of course, Thunderbolt and USB 4, where here you don't have USB Thunderbolt 4, you don't have USB 4 Thunderbolt 4, but you have the TB header. So if you did wanna add Thunderbolt 4, you could do that via the add-in card, right? Um, so just some of the differences there of course will be more that are going to be present in there but those are just some of the differences okay so let's uh go back now and take a look actually at the rg strix lineup here and let me go ahead and just put these up right here yeah so this should be e f a i okay perfect okay so these will be the four boards within the ROG Strix lineup, right? So when we talk about the boards that we'll have available, uh, this will be the ROG Strix-E, then we'll have the ROG Strix-F, then we'll have the ROG Strix-A, and then we'll have the ROG Strix-I. So ATX, 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 and then mini ITX, right? And uh, we'll talk about some of the differences between kind of the dash E and the dash F, because a lot of people ask about that. We can also, of course, include uh, the dash A, but uh, one of the key differentials is, of course, going to be memory specification support, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, bring these ones up here. And we'll start off with the dash E. So with the dash E, uh, this board is going to be 18 plus one in terms of the overall power stage configuration. You're going to see that this one has a PCI Express Gen 5 for that primary by 16. This one will support up to five M.2 base SSDs on this motherboard, right? Um, uh, critically, one big thing is you're going to see is that that primary, that one that's there on the top is going to support PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD. So both the PCI Express Gen 5 uh, by 16 slot as well as the PCI Express Gen 5 for the M.2 SSD are both going to be Gen 5. So both of them will support Gen 5 based operation. Okay. So that is going to be a nice benefit that you're going to have. So keep that in mind. So up to five M.2 based SSDs, uh, but you have Gen 5 support for the PCI Express by 16 and PCI Express, uh, excuse me, uh, PCI Express Gen 5 for the M.2 base SSD. You'll see though that unlike the Apex, the Extreme, or the Maximus, there's not dual PCI Express Gen 5 slots, right? Only one primary PCI Express Gen 5 slot, right? Okay. Uh, 18 plus one power stages, a large robust VRM heatsink that's gonna be present on this one. The Dash E will also have a large heat pipe. So this is a heat pipe that connects the two heat sinks together that is gonna be present on here, okay? Um, memory support is gonna be pretty similar in terms of the overall specification memory support. You also do have the debug LED that's on there. You have the start button that's also gonna be on there. And I'll take a little bit of a flyover in terms of some of the um, kind of just physical connectors that'll be on the motherboard, right? Uh, when we take a look here at the rear I.O., we're going to see we have two, four, so six, 
10, 12, 12 ports. So very similar to the Maximus line right there. Have a little bit of difference in terms of the rated uh, specification support, right? So on the Maximus series, you could see 40 gigabits USB 4, right? Uh, Thunderbolt, but here you can see you have 20 gigabits is the max, you have 10 gigabits, and then you also have five gigabits connectors. A nice update for uh, multiple of the boards as you're gonna see is that you have the clear CMOS button right there. So there's a clear CMOS, USB BIOS flashback, DP and HDMI, Wi-Fi 6C, and then of course that multi-channel audio out with the Supreme FX audio codec and the ALC uh, 4080. This does have the Savvy Tech amp, which is an upgrade compared to let's say what you would have on the Tough Gaming. So the Tough Gaming will not have the discrete Savvy Tech amp that's on there. So that's a little bit of an upgrade that gives you just a little bit more punch, um, a little bit more vol volume range in terms of your analog headphones if you're gonna be utilizing that. You have the Q release connector that's on there, uh, USB, 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 so that's 20 gigabits internally. So 20 gigabits on the internal connector and 20 gigabits on the rear connector, and then your USB 3 header that's on there, and then Thunderbolt header that's also on this board, okay? So that is going to be uh, the Dash E, and we will take a closer look right here. And we're gonna go pretty quickly to the dash F right after this. I'm just gonna show you guys a little bit of a, just flyover of it, just so you can see it. Okay, but here is the, there's the dash E. Really nice, cool layered display that we have there. Dual EPS power connectors right there. Uh, CPU fan, secondary CPU OPT fan. You have the AIO pump header, ARGB headers, and debug LED. You have the start button that's also on there. As you move right there, and the internal 20 gigabits. Uh, reinforced internal USB 3 header that's going to be on there. Um, you have four SATA ports that are going to be on there. Okay. Uh, large and robust PCI Gen 5 M.2 SSD heatsink that is gonna be on this board right here. So you can see it even has a large heat pipe that's gonna be on there. You have the Q release ejection mechanism that's also gonna be on this board and all of the M.2 slots all have M.2 based heat sinks. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you do also have the Q, Q latch design. You'll also see right here you have on the very bottom, you have the uh, fan speed and the PCI alteration mode switch that's gonna be on there, internal USB 2 headers, the Thunderbolt header, and then your, of course your chassis fan headers. So all of that good stuff all on this board. So pretty well stacked. And so I think a very popular option for a lot of users that are gonna be kind of looking for really kind of getting all of the I think pretty nice features, but without going to maybe some of the more specialized features that you might have on some of the Maximus series-based motherboards. And so again, um, I already you know have confirmed this for you, but this board does also have the M.2 Q latch design, but let me just go ahead and show you right here. If I remove this heatsink. Uh, but this is gonna be an area where the Maximus would have like a little bit of a higher end configuration. Is that we'll see that when I remove this heatsink, this one is not a dual contact design, so you still just have heat sink on one side as opposed to dual contact, but it still has the Q-latch design. On this uh, primary though, the PCI Express Gen 5, the PCI Express Gen 5 is dual contact. So you still have the M.2 heat sink that's gonna be on the top and also the M.2 heat sink that'll be on the bottom. So you get both of them available to you, okay? Uh, can I do RAID 0 on the 4M.2? Um, I don't know that you would want to do that. I mean, I don't recommend a 4 driver RAID configuration in that type of scenario. Also, the way that the PCI lane links are um, designed, right, you have to account for PCI links that are going through the CPU versus PCI links that are going through the chipset. Um, so it's not something I would recommend. Um, you do have RAID 0 support um, on this platform. So if you do want to do it, RAID 0 or RAID 1, but I'm not a fan of RAID configurations just because uh, there's actually quite a number of reasons. But, you know, if you do want to do RAID 0 or RAID 1, you do have it, you do have it available to you. All right, uh, that is going to be the dash E. Let me go ahead and quickly see if we have any questions there before we get over to the dash F. Um, <laughs> is that a Pac-Man? There's uh, some cool little iconography that you're going to see on there, right? Um, uh, 
actually saying is the dash e and the dash f is is identical everything apart from the power stages this is actually wrong it's actually quite wrong um so we're actually going to cover the the actual differences right now because there's actually a lot of differences between the dash e and the dash f and a lot of people make a mistake about just thinking that it's just the power stages so it's not just the power stages so for clarification on the dash e uh, the dash e will be 18 plus 1 and 90 amp power stages right they're sps based and then the dash f will be 16 plus 1 one and 90 amp power stages the dash a is also going to be 16 plus one and then the dash i will be a 10 plus one but it'll be 105 amp power stages and if i didn't say for the dash a the dash a is 70 amps in terms of the power stages but uh, we're going to get into actually into talking a little bit more about the differences here on the dash i and uh excuse me the give me one second here uh, the e and the excuse me the E and the F. So let me bring up back up my images here. Okay. All right. So let me see here if I have uh, the other images that I want to be able to go ahead and touch on. So the other kind of the biggest difference that you're going to have on the dash F once we bring this up here is going to be actually the M.2 based configuration parameters. So uh, let's go ahead and bring this up here. So when we take a look here at the actual layout, right, um, one, power stages are different. Power stages are going to be um, uh, higher, right, on the dash E versus the dash F. But when we take a look here at the M.2, the dash, F, the dash E supports more, right? It has five M.2 versus the four M.2, right? Um, and you're also going to see that these are only PCI Express Gen 4. So the Dash E gives you native PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support. So the Dash F will give you PCI Express Gen 5 for, of course, your primary by 16 slot, uh, but it does not give you PCI Express Gen 5 for that M.2 based SSD. Now, again, the reality of that is it's not necessarily a critical factor, but for some users that wonder a design specification difference, it's a very big difference because, of course, the board topology and the layout and the design has to be quite different to be able to support concurrent um, PCI Express Gen 5 for the M.2 base SSD and PCI Express Gen 5 uh, for the by 16 slot graphics. So that is going to be another difference right there. Okay. Um, there is also going to be a difference in terms of the actual uh, uh, heatsink design where the dash E has the heat pipe. This one does not. It has two just large robust VRM heatsinks. They're again, not going to be thermally constrained stock or overclock. The experience is going to be pretty much almost identical, but users that have a preference, there is going to be an edge in terms of that regard. So do keep that in mind there. Okay. Um, so that is going to be another one of the differences that you have available to you. Um, um, now, when we take a look here at the rear I.O., rear I.O. is also going to be a little bit different in terms that you're going to see that you have two USB 2 ports here, where if you remember it on the dash E, the dash E did not. The dash E actually had more. So we can see right here we have two, we have four, so six, uh, excuse me, six, and then we have 10 here and we have 12. So 12 ports, right? But take a look at these two top ports, right? And then we go back to the dash F. So if we go back to the dash F, you'll also notice these are going to be five gigabits. So you get two more high speed ports. So you can notice that the kind of the key difference in it is we're starting to look at kind of premium upgrades where we have the PCI Express Gen 5 with the heat pipe, right? Higher performing. We have the higher performing VRM. We have the heat pipe in the VRM. We also have more IO that's going to be higher speed uh, that's going to be present on there, right? Uh, with the dash F, you can see here you have just a high performance um, M.2 based heatsink, but not Gen 5 not the larger heatsink uh, the uh, reduction there to the usb2 but you still have lots of high speed you still have also 20 gigabits on the rear 10 gigabits on here and 5 gigabits there right the internal type c connector is also going to be a 20 gigabit connector so both 20 gigabits internally and 20 gigabits on the rear reinforced usb3 header that's going to also be on there thunderbolt header and four sata ports q release and also this board has q latch um, you'll also see that the dash e has the debug led this one does not have the debug LED, but it does have the Q code LED display. Audio design is going to be the same, 4080 with the Savitech audio uh, amp, and then three RGB headers, just like the uh, three RGB headers that are also going to be on the Dash E. Okay, so. Um, so. Uh, 
Morar, sorry if I'm saying that, and I can't use a PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD on the Dash F. No, you can 100% use it because all PCI Express Gen 5, excuse me, all uh, M.2 based SSDs are backwards compatible. So you could run a PCI Express Gen 4 M.2 SSD on a Gen 3 slot, right? It would still work. And so Gen 5 M.2 SSD will still work on that. It's just going to run not at maximum Gen 5 speed. So, um, it's again, not critical in a gaming scenario. Actually, I can tell you that even going down to a SATA drive, SATA drive almost offers generally about the same loading performance. Patching performance might be a little bit different between PC Express and SATA, but even under gaming, the performance is actually very similar between the two drives. Um, so it's not necessarily a critical requirement, but for users that want the best performance, the best experience, they like to always have that kind of specification support. And again, this is a difference between the Dash E and between the Dash F, okay? All right. Um, so let me go ahead and just see there if we have any questions on the dash F and the dash E. If not, we're going to go over to the dash A. Um, Simon is asking, is 16 plus one good enough for a 3900K? Yes. Um, even if we went down to eight power stages, it would be enough uh, for that. The main benefit of actually having the higher number of power stages is critically actually one efficiency and then two is actually going to be thermal balancing is that actually we can distribute the actual thermals more across the entirety of the VRM array. So that's really kind of one of the key benefits. It's not so much that we need it to power that because again, even when we go down to the more entry boards, uh, Tough Gaming, which will even have a lower number of power stages, they still can comfortably uh, run a 1300k overclocked, uh, you know, at six gigahertz, right? So it's not a limiting factor. Uh, again, you do not have to be worried about the teamed power stage design on any one of the boards uh, that we're going to be going over today. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and just see if there was any other quick questions that were there, right? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over into the Dash A. You can see that the Dash A has this really, really nice kind of course uh, design aesthetic on there, which of course is going to be silver. So this is another great option. A uh, really, really popular for white themed base builders, right? They want to be able to pair this up. It was very popular with our white 30 series base graphics cards, which are of course also still available on the market. And you can pair it up with all so many of our other white peripherals so and white components. So this is going to be another nice option for you. The big thing that you're you're going to see here though is this is a d4 designation which means that this is a ddr4 based motherboard so um, it is not going to be uh, excuse me it is not going to be uh, a ddr5 based motherboard so it is going to be ddr4 so do keep that in mind Okay, so when we take a look here at the overall uh, design layout, large robust VRM heat sinks again that are also extended. Uh, make sure to keep things every everything going to be cool and reliable. 16 plus one. Um, these are going to be dropped down though, right? Where you're going to have 70 amp power stages versus the 90 amp power stages. Um, in terms of the slot layout configuration, very similar. Four M.2 based SSDs. You have the Q release design. You're also going to get PCI Express Gen 4, not Gen 5. So do keep that in mind. So um, where we saw again before we had PCI Express Gen 5 for the by 16 slot, right? Here you're going to have PCI Express Gen 4, right? So uh, Gen 4 and then Gen 4, right? So that is going to be a difference that you're going to have there. Okay. Um, looking here at the rear I.O., very similar two USB 2, then we have uh, five gigabits USB 3, then we have 10 gigabits and 20 gigabits, right? So we have two, four, six, 10. So 10 ports versus 12 ports, right? Um, a nice upgrade though, don't forget this, this is we did add this, is you get clear CMOS now on both. Uh, if you actually looked on the Dash F, we gave you clear CMOS, and on the Dash A, we gave you clear CMOS. I pushed really hard to add these in for this generation. So I would really appreciate you guys letting us know in the community that you appreciate having clear CMOS on actually the Dash E, the Dash F, and the Dash A, because we did not use to offer the clear CMOS buttons on uh, these other models, okay? So if you guys appreciate that, please let us know within the comments uh, and in the community that you like having that functionality there, okay? Um, you've got HDMI, you have DisplayPort 2.5 gig LAN, Wi-Fi 6E. Keep in mind, 
all the boards essentially have that Wi-Fi 6E and they all are running that uh, i226 latest generation 2.5 gigabit controller. The Q release design, the reinforced USB 3. This is also 20 gigabits for the internal USB-C header. So 20 gigabits here and 20 gigabits on the rear. Many of you, if you might be coming from a board that first implemented um, you know, USB-C internally on the header, if it even had it, maybe your motherboard didn't even have it, it might only been a five gigabit connector. It might not even been a 20 gigabit or even a 10 gigabit. So do keep in mind, there's a lot of subtle upgrades that you're always looking at that a lot of reviews and, and media sometimes won't talk about that you wanna take a look at the entirety of the motherboard experience where you're talking about the IO, internal connections, the audio design, fan controls, so many elements that could be and make, be offering you an improvement experience compared to what you're running, right? Um, same ALC4080 audio codec, um, along with that Sevitech audio amp design and the Sonic Studio 3 software, three ARGB headers that are gonna be on there. And the audio, excuse me, the ARGB design on the IO Shroud is very similar in terms of kind of the uh, dash E and the dash F as well, okay? So this board also does have the Thunderbolt header that's gonna be on there as well. Okay. The DDR board is not a good board for DDR5 users. Um, so Mar, I don't know where you get that from, um, but I would 100% disagree with you in that respect. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example right here is, um, this is our, actually our Z690 board. Um, and so this is DDR5 right here. This is actually running um, 6400 MT on the Dash A model. And I can run this on both the Dash A from Z690 on the RG Strix and the Prime series, which are positioned underneath the RG Strix models, no problem. So from a DDR5 experience, I've shown actually multiple streams and in our community, the overall DDR5 experience is gonna be very comparable. You don't need to kind of have any concerns in terms of the overall stability or reliability when it comes to the DRAM experience. ROG boards, the Maximus will always have a little bit more advanced kind of tuning parameters, but 6400 was already out quite in the norm of most users weren't gonna be running 6400 and I can run that without any issues. And with better quality memory controllers, I actually can even run higher than that even on, again, on a Dash A model. So you are not limited um, in terms of that overall experience. And keep in mind for rapid Raptor Lake, the IMC performance is even better uh, than it was for um, Alder Lake. And so we actually are seeing that kind of almost 7,000 MT is the new normal and 7,000 MT is gonna be possible on these boards as well, okay? So, um, yeah. Um, so I think that covers us there for the Dash A, guys, in case anybody has any uh, questions there on the Dash A. If not, we're gonna get ready to go to the um, Dash I, which would be the mini ITX, okay? So let me just see, does anybody have any questions right there? Uh, the dashy model is correct, it's gonna be DDR4, that is right. If these boards are dual channel, are four DIMMs of DDR5 not as good as two? Um, so for gaming, don't run four DIMMs. There's no point. You really only want to run two DIMMs because two DIMMs is going to give you also the highest DRAM scaling. Um, and it's also going to be the less demanding on the memory controller. We have actually a great video that we did with our friends at Kingston, as well as our friends at Crucial on DDR5 that you can watch here on the channel, or you can join our PCDIY group linked in the description where we do a DDR5 insights post to give you more insight. But pretty much rank, density, population, IC affect your memory scaling. And um, the less stressful that you make that configuration, the higher the actual scaling can be. And if you wanna be able to get the best performance possible, it's gonna be in a one DPC, one SPC based configuration. So essentially that means two DIMMs. So my recommendation for most gamers, if your focus is gaming, get like the 13600K and get like, you know, um, you know, anything from 6,000 to higher in terms of the MT divider on memory, especially with Raptor Lake, the scaling is quite good. So you could go quite high, okay? Um, so, all right. Um, all right, let's 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 go ahead and go over to the Dash I guys. Um, and we will keep moving this along. Okay, so give me one second here to bring up uh, the Dash I. And so I'm gonna bring up a couple images here of the Dash I first before we get into a little bit of a closer look. So here for the Dash I, 
Uh, you'll see, of course, this is a mini ITX, and one of the big updates for this generation will be the inclusion of this little breakout box, which will be the Hive. And we'll talk about some of the cool design features in terms of what you have available to you in the Hive, including debug, USB pass-through, audio functionality in terms of how you can tune it, um, a lot of really cool design elements that are going to be present on here, as well as a redesigned, I think, what we call... Um, KO zone, which is a keep out zone to be able to maximize, I think, the overall flexibility and the interoperability with different types of coolers. So um, if you are interested in small form factor, then this is going to be the board for you. So let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the Dash I, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the Dash I. So mini ITX, um, you're going to see a, course, a couple of things that are going to look unique on this, which will be right here, which will be the FPS2 adding card, and then you'll also see the Hive breakout module. So we're going to talk about those two things in a little bit here. Um, but first, taking a look at the board here, you're going to have a 10 uh, power stage based design implementation, but this is actually going to be similar to the power stage rating that we would have like on the Maxima series, 105 amp uh, power stage rating on here. So very, very high performance. Again, doesn't matter what CPU you're going to be running in here there's no concerns or limitations in terms of stability or reliability it uh, doesn't matter whether it's a 13600 13700 13900 um, they're all going to run fantastic okay so no concerns in there again stock or overclocked um, so 10 plus one um, you're going to have of course two dim slots right here this is going to be a fantastic board especially if you're going to want to run higher mt based memory configurations with raptor lake really being uh, quite performant in terms of this type of configuration you're going to expect most cpus not all but a uh, good amount of them are going to be able to comfortably be able to hit 7000 MT so quite impressive that you'll be able to have that performance within a small form factor based build uh, you'll see in terms of the M.2 and PCIe specification support you have dual gen 5 support so gen 5 on the primary by 16 slot and then you're also going to have gen 5 that are going to be on the M.2 you're going to have two M.2 slots on this motherboard so uh, this is a little bit different in the prior generation where we had kind of a little bit of a, a tiered specialized design which gave you kind of some cool flexibility but but uh, to be able to maximize interoperability and compatibility, we've gone ahead and made some design revisions for this generation. So um, we've tried to account to try to give you the most space for those of you that want to kind of run tower coolers, but still also give you the flexibility to have two M.2 base SSDs, right? So um, when we take a look here at the overall uh, heatsink design, this does have a dual contact heatsink design. So there's a heatsink here and a heatsink here, and there's a heat pipe, um, and there's also going to be a fan that will be present that's going to uh, be within this uh, portion of the io shroud and that's also why there's actually a little bit of kind of like mesh filtering that's right there that can go ahead and be removed easily so if you want to clean that out over time you can go ahead and do that uh, we have also gone ahead and integrated um, the temperature sensor there's actually two temperature sensors so i know that some people wish that we had the temperature sensor in z690 and so i worked really hard to work with our team to push to make sure that we reintroduced it back for this generation for the small form factor community especially those doing uh, closed water cooling so no worries uh if you weren't happy that it didn't have it last generation, we have reintroduced making sure that you do have the temperature input sensor available to you for this generation, right? So you do have that on the card as well. Uh, and then you have, of course, your internal USB-C header and your USB 3 that is also going to be present on this board, okay? Um, taking a look here at the rear I.O., um, let me see right here. Somebody's asking, uh, are motherboard drivers for the Z79 compatible with Windows Server? Uh, we don't do actually Windows Server validation for any of the motherboards uh, that are outside of, let's say, like our CSM or workstation and server-based product, which are designed for that operating system environment. So I can't tell you whether or not you might be able to take general purpose drivers that might be made available from Intel and then run that. Um, you know, if you send me an email, pcdow.asus.com, I can see if maybe our FIA team has done any maybe potential interoperability or compatibility with some of our system integrated partners that may be running um, that operating system environment but our primary focus and validation is uh, the of course os environments that are targeted for these platforms which would be windows 10 and optimally windows 11 especially with 12th gen and 13th gen series processors okay on the rear io right we have hdmi we have uh, that is 2.1 um, you do have then two usb 2 ports you have your uh, thunderbolt that's going to be present on here you have 20 gigabits and then 10 gigabits so um, you've got essentially six type a ports 
uh, four of those being, uh, excuse me, three of those being uh, 10 gigabits, one being five gigabits, and then you've got your uh, two Thunderbolt 4 ports, which means up to 40 gigabits, and you have 20 gigabits. So you pretty much have all the specifications that are there, five gigabits, 10 gigabits, and 20 gigabits, uh, and 40 gigabits, right? So it's all there. Wi-Fi 6E, which also has Bluetooth. And another one, if you guys notice right here, is the clear CMOS also on the Dash I. So you still have the clear CMOS that's going to be on the rear of that motherboard, okay? On the internal little breakout card right here, you have your two internal USB 2 headers, right? So that's great for like AIO coolers, ARGB fan controllers, things like that. Um, you might want to go ahead and plug in, and then you'll have additional SATA ports. You also have the alteration mode switch, uh, which is uh, I talked about already before, which could be quite advantageous in terms of if you're using a riser cable. So we see a lot of people use riser cables in these small form factor based builds. That is also going to be present on there, right? And then that internal USB-C connector is also going to be a 20 gigabits USB-C connector because it's USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2, right? So you have a high speed base connector. The high breakout box right here is going to be not only the standard ALC 48, excuse me, 4050 codec, which has been specially tuned to give us great experience there, but also has been paired with the ESS Sabre DAC and AMP. Um, so that's going to be a premium compared to normally RG Strix boards do not have the ESS Sabre DAC and AMP, but specifically here for the Hive, we want to be able to give you an even better audio experience. So you get that ESS Sabre DAC and AMP built into this. Uh, you can connect, of course, your headphones to that. Um, and you'll also have full volume control that's available. You you can enable Asus AIOC. You have a debug LED that is also visible right here, actually on the Hive breakout. You have USB pass-through, so there's a lot of functionality. And we're also even evaluating whether or not we might be able to do uh, fan control functionality um, from um, from the actual Hive, but right now that's TBD, it's not finalized, right? So uh, from a VRM perspective, again, just recapping, you can see right here, 18 plus one on the Dash E, 16 plus one, 16 plus one, and 10 plus one, 90, 90, 90, 70, excuse me, 90, 90, 70, and 105. And these are all SPS, which means they're smart power stages, okay? Um, let me just go ahead and see if there's anything. Um, this is a little bit of just a kind of uh, exploded view on the actual design for the Dash I, where you can see that we do have, like I said, that heat pipe, and then we have actually active cooling that's present in here. And so the active cooling has been designed to be able to go ahead and give us very, very good thermal dissipation performance for not only the actual VRM assembly, but also for the large, robust PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD, because of course those drives, when they are released to the market, will actually have higher thermal envelopes uh, than what you're going to have for PCI Express Gen 4. So this is partly the reason why we have this type of design implementation present. So this gives us the granularity and control to be able to ensure that we're going to get good temperatures for the chipset, we're going to get good temperatures for the VRM, and we're going to get good temperatures for the M.2 base SSDs. Okay, So uh, it is something that we have carefully evaluated um, to be able to ensure that we get really good experience in that regard. All right. Um, so from there, um, fan connectors, I didn't recount them. I can count them here on the boards, but you're going to have essentially, um, I think a total of uh, pretty much on almost all the boards, you're going to have seven connectors. So you're going to have the AIO pump connector. You'll have two CPU connectors, and then you'll have five chassis fan headers. So there's going to be tons of chassis fan headers on here. So a lot of flexibility, again, for you that are looking for kind of traditional setup and controls. So um, I can go ahead and recap that on the dashy if we want to take a closer look, um, but I can show you that quickly. Okay, and uh, let me just see. Uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to show you guys. So here you can see a close-up of the Hive breakout box, right? So the Hive breakout box, you can do the USB BIOS flashback right there. There's a dedicated port. Uh, you have the connection port for the actual Type-C, uh, which of course be 10 gigabits. Uh, you then have your SPDF optical out, as well as your standard combo jack, right? Headphone jack with mic. Um, you have, of course, the volume control with mute, the flex key button, which you could use for different functions, right? Uh, One-touch ASUS AIOC button, USB BIOS flashback, and the Q LED diagnostic LED that's going to be on the Hive. Um, the ProArt, hey, Preco, I'm going to be getting to the ProArt in just a little bit, so don't worry about that. I will be touching on the ProArt, okay? 
And lastly here for the FPS2 card, this is just giving you a little bit of that different perspective so you can see the actual FPS2 add-in card right there. So again, that has two internal USB 2 headers, the front panel connector, the alteration mode switch, which also I believe should be able to be mapped to fan control functionality, two SATA ports that are gonna be on there, and then your optional temp sensor that you're gonna have there, but there's also a secondary temp sensor. So you have essentially two temp sensors that are available to you on this board, right? So quite a bit of flexibility that that little adding card gives you there. Okay. All right, uh, that should cover us in terms of the, the ROG Strix series. So let me go ahead and uh, see right there. Um, Bloodhound is asking, did I mix the Maximus showcase? Yeah, so we talked about Maximus in the very beginning, the Extreme, uh, the Hero, and the Apex. So you, it's this will be on demand. I don't know if you're watching on YouTube, you should be able to actually go back early in the stream if you do want to be able to see the overview. But we did already touch on the Maximus, and so now we're on the ROG Strix series, okay? Um... Will it only have two SATA ports? Yes, only two SATA ports are available on the Dash Eye. That is correct. Yep. Braytheon saying uh, Dashy should be all you need for gaming and streaming. I think the Dashy is great, but really, if you're just talking about just basic gaming or streaming, then of course, really any one of the motherboards would work, including the tough gaming motherboards, which we're going to get to in just a little bit. So um, it really just comes down again to, I always ask users is that what you really kind of want to be mindful of is, is that do you... Um, you know, do you want a certain number of I.O., right? So do you want a certain number of USB ports? In our polling of over 30,000 users, uh, we found actually that one of the most common reasons why people make an upgrade from one board to another board is actually going to be the number of USB ports and sometimes also the slots for expansion. So that's something you have to carefully evaluate. From a gaming performance perspective, all the boards will offer you the same gaming performance. So if you just want something that's going to be stable and reliable, pick any of the boards you want within the budget and you're going to be good to go. Um, but how you break down the boards is really gonna come down more so in terms of what you what you appreciate in terms of kind of specification support, right? So that is gonna be what you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind there, right? So um, let me go ahead and I'll just do this as a quick recap right here for the Dash A before we go into, um, excuse me, the Tough Gaming series. But here's the Dash E, the Dash F, the Dash A, and the Dash I, right? And so we can see right here, uh, of course, the difference in terms of the power stages, but again, they're all gonna be stable and reliable with any one of them. Um, the bigger kind of differentiation is gonna be, of course, with that PCI Express with the slots right and then of course with that m.2 right so here we can see the dash e again has pci express gen 5 for the uh primary physical by 16 and then pci express gen 5 for the m.2 and has five m.2s that can be supported whereas like on the dash f the dash f has gen 5 and then four but no pci express gen 5 for m.2 and then for the dash a similarly um dash a gives you gen 5 for pci express right uh, but you don't have pci express gen 5 for m.2 but you still have four and four m.2 right so um gen 5 across the board for all of these right for pci express and then for m.2 that's where you see some more variants right um, all of them are the same in terms of the wi-fi and the lan you then have more differences in the usb ports right where like the dash e there's no legacy usb 2 as you drop down to some of these other you might see a couple of usb 2 ports audio design is pretty much consistent on all of them argb is consistent on all of them fan headers is consistent on all of them all of them support the thunderbolt header all of them support the same sata ports right so again just kind of pick uh you know the respective features or functions there's also a few other things too where like all the boards as i noted support asus aioc right uh, but you also want to maybe took like other aspects might be things like integrated io shield that's now consistent on all of them so you don't have to worry about that q release is also going to be um, present on all of the boards which is really nice but like the qled if you really want qled and debug led you're only going to get that on take for instance the dash e right so just some things to keep in mind there right all right so let's go ahead and uh oh jc you know what i'm gonna go ahead and take a sip right here all right okay so um we're gonna go ahead and jump into uh the tough gaming all right so give me a second here actually i'm probably turn that back on there in a second all right uh 
and let me go ahead and get uh, the Tough Gaming over here. Oh, and um, in terms of pricing, let me just go ahead and recap that because in case, I mean, you should be able to see all the pricing right now online for that. But the Dash E is $499, the Dash F is $419, the Dash A is $379, and the Dash I is $469, okay? So again, uh, Dash E is $499, Dash F is $419, Dash A is three seventy nine, and the Dash I is four sixty nine. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead um, and take a look at the Tough Gaming. And you guys will be able to see a little bit of the difference. So this is going to be one of the new ones here in terms of the Tough Gaming lineup, right? Where we've got the DDR five, and we're going to have the DDR four right so actually this is going to be incorrect so i'm going to go ahead and make a quick edit to that so we're going to actually have three so we're going to have actually three boards we'll have the ddr5 now and we're going to have the ddr4 oh that heat sink was a little sharp. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't cut myself. All right, there we go. Oh, all right, everybody knows the pain of building, right? There we go. I even bleed for you guys on the stream. <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. All right, so there you can see a little bit of a difference there in terms of the design ID, if you guys can notice it. I'll show a little bit side-by-side -side image. Uh, there's just a little bit maybe more white that'll be on the DDR4 version versus the DDR5 version, okay? So it's the DDR5 version. Um, Excuse me, there's a DDR5 version, DDR4 version. I like maybe the DDR5 version a little bit more. I think in terms of the ID, I think it's really, really cool. We'll throw them both under the camera just to kind of be able to see them. But uh, there you have it. Here's the DDR5 version, very, very stealthy, and then DDR4 version. Okay, so those are going to be the two tough gaming motherboards. Um, so let's go ahead and get ready to take a closer look there at the two. All right, and let me go ahead and get that out. Um, and for Tough Gaming, um, let me see if I have actually the updated pricing for the DDR5. For the Tough Gaming, it should be 289 uh, for that. And then for the DDR4, I don't think I have the confirmed pricing for the DDR5 base version, okay? So just uh, you kind of have to wait there and see how it shows up, guys. Um, but let me go ahead and get this one up here, and we'll show you right here. Let's put these side by side. Okay, so here you guys can see, uh, this is gonna be the uh, DDR5 version. So you see that there's no D4 designation, right? If we go ahead and go really close into the name, you'll see that there's no DDR5. And then here you'll see that says D4. So that helps us know that we have, this is a DDR4 version and this is the DDR5 version. And so a little bit of just difference in terms of the iconography and the design language. I really like the design here of the DDR5 version, but both of them look fantastic. They're going to, of course, be really complimentary, of course, with our Tough Gaming ID design that we have on all our latest components. I think these will look great with, of course, uh, 4080, um, you know, or, of course, our 30 series. And, of course, we have our uh, GT series chassis. So the GT301, GT501, and the brand new GT502, which is a really cool split chamber uh, based chassis design. In terms of the rest of the kind of specifications, these are all going to pretty much be identical. So I'm going to run through the DDR4 version. You'll see that there's a little bit of a difference though in terms of the power uh, EPS connectors. This is a dual 8 pin piece EPS power connector, um, and this is going to be a uh, a four and excuse me an eight and a four. 
Do keep in mind these are still pro cool power connectors. So again, just like the other boards that we talked about, they have a higher level of current handling than a standard power connector. So their performance is already very, very high end. Um, and there's not gonna be any kind of limiting factors in there. Um, new upgrades too for this generation, you'll see that the Tough Gaming do also get the Q release design. So both of these will have the actual Q release design implementation. They both have internal type C connectors. They both have um, higher numbers of, of course, those uh, internal ARGB headers. So you've got one, two, and then if we go down here at the bottom, you've got three, four, right? And then that's gonna be the same right there. You got three, four. This also has a Thunderbolt header. This one also has a Thunderbolt header, the same audio design, same IO configuration, all that good stuff. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into those right here. So let me go ahead and just bring that up. All right. So uh, here we can take a look at in terms of the overall configuration. So this is gonna be a 16 plus one power stage configuration um, with 60 amp power stages. Again, very large and robust VRM heat sinks. Uh, these also extend fully into the actual IO shroud. Um, so you don't actually um, have just kind of just heat sinks that are covering just the primary components, but you do have actually even additional surface area there to really be able to give you a broad amount of coverage. So it's quite nice in that regard. Um, and I will uh, hook them up here in a little bit, but if we take a quick look right here, and uh, let me just remove this, you'll see right here that what I'm referring to is that this heat sink, right, um, this actually fully extends over into this section. So that's something you already saw kind of many on the other motherboards, right, but it's also present here, right? So rear IO, you can see you've dropped down to a little bit less IO than you saw in some of the RG Strix series. Still a good amount, two, four, six, and seven, and then eight. So you have eight ports. That's still quite a number of amount of ports, but of course on higher end boards, you saw as much as like 12 ports. So again, if you need maybe more rear ports, that's the difference in terms of going to a higher end board. Um, we're here. You can also see there's a little bit of a difference where you have five gigabits, more five gigabits, and less 10 gigabits. So five gigabits and then 10 gigabits, 10 gigabits, but you do still have 20 gigabits so you still have kind of all three speeds there you're just missing 40 gigabits right so 5 gigabits 10 gigabits and then 20 gigabits so that's still quite nice and you still get two USB-C you get Wi-Fi 6 not Wi-Fi 6e uh, that is a key difference right still later generation Bluetooth you have multi-channel audio out and optical out that's going to be present on here no clear CMOS button, right? Like you had on the ROG Strix. So that is a little bit of a differential there, right? Um, and then in terms of the overall slot layout configuration, we can see we have up to four M.2 SSDs, no Gen 5 M.2 SSD here support. If you want that, you're gonna go over into ROG Strix or Maximus, right? And then here, uh, the physical by 16 is of course gonna be PCI Express Gen 5, just like all of the RG Strix, all the Maximus, all of them at a minimum give you PCI Express Gen 5 for the graphics. You also have that same here on the Tough Gaming. And then that internal USB-C header, that's a little bit of a different. It's an internal USB-C, but it's not a 20 gigabit connector. So keep in mind that on like RG6, you saw 20 gigabits on the internal and also on the rear. So you had higher speed internally and externally. Again, the reason why we do that those it's a more costly implementation need 20 gigabits internally and also in our polling again of over actually 50,000 users um, we've actually seen that the majority of users only have five gigabit based devices so this is more than fast enough for their storage devices right um, but if you again wanted faster speed you do also have an internal thunderbolt header that's also on this board Audio codec is gonna be a little bit different than the ROG Strix where it's the S1220A, right? And it does not have the Savvy Tech amp, right? Where you do have that on the ROG Strix models. Uh, last but not least, keep in mind that the audio suite and the, and the networking suite are gonna be different. Game First and Sonic Studio are exclusive to the ROG series of motherboards, right? So that is gonna be a differential there. These boards also do not feature the ASUS AIOC technology. That does not mean that you cannot overclock them. It just means that you are going to manually overclock them in terms of either using XTU or doing it in the UEFI BIOS. You just don't have kind of the one touch options to be able to um, be able to kind of easily and effectively overclock the CPU based on your CPU and then your CPU's cooler, right? So uh, let me go ahead and just quickly connect this here. I'll connect both of them, uh, the DDR5 version and the DDR4 version, just so you guys can see them really quick. And let me bring up the questions right here just so I can see that. All right, so... Um, Papir Comet, 
Um, if I'm saying that right, are there any AMD motherboards that support DDR5? All of the all of the AMD AM5 motherboards are all DDR5. So whether it's B B series or X series, they all support DDR5. Okay. So uh, here we can see the overall design language. Really nice, really clean. Again, like I said, monochrome, new vector design language that we have on here. Large, robust VRM heatsinks. A lot of fan headers, right? So again, if we take a look at the uh, the headers that we've got right here, this is going to be um, CPU optional, CPU, and then AIO right so that's going to give us of course three right there and we've got another fan header right here uh, then we've got another fan header right here and another fan header right here uh, and then one more fan header right here so quite a bit of flexibility um, in terms of the fan header so again if you miss those let me just go ahead and recap that this is one fan header, right here, fan header here another fan header here another fan header here and then internally there's a one right there, right? So quite a number of fan headers that you have available. You have the Q-release ejection mechanism. Um, now on these boards, none of them are gonna have the dual contact heatsink design, so do keep that in mind. So um, if I just go ahead and remove the heatsink right here, the ROG Strix boards, remember, do at least have one at a minimum that is gonna have the dual contact heatsink design. But you'll see there on the Tough Gaming, you have the heatsink, and then you also have the nice easy Q latch design to allow you to easily install your M.2 base SSD. But keep in mind, the dual heatsink design isn't as critical because we don't also have the PCI Express Gen 5 support that you do have on the uh, ROG Strix, say on select models, or of course on the ROG uh, Maximus uh, models, right? So just something to kind of keep in mind there in terms of a differential. Okay, so that is going to be the DDR4 version. Let me go ahead and show you the DDR5 version. And I'm gonna take a look at in the comment section in a moment. All right, so there you can see, this is the DDR5 version. Large, robust heat sinks. Again, I really like the design aesthetic on this one. I think it looks really, really cool. I really like this design language on the DDR5 version. And pretty much everything is the same on this one. It's just the DDR5 variant. Okay. All right. That is going to be... other um, and one difference though I do want to make a note of here on the uh, DDR excuse me on the DDR5 version so on the DDR5 version the Wi-Fi that will be on that model is going to be Wi-Fi I'm pretty sure it's Wi-Fi 6e yeah it's Wi-Fi 6e on the DDR5 version okay so on the DDR4 version it is not. So DDR5 version is going to be Wi-Fi 6E, where on the DDR4 version, it is Wi-Fi 6. Okay. So um, I think I have the images for that. So let me go ahead and bring those up quickly, and I'll show you that. So give me one second here. Uh, tough Gaming. Yep, Wi-Fi. Yep, here it is. And then we have Tough Gaming DDR4 Wi-Fi. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's take a look at those side by side. Okay, here you guys go. All right, and so here, if you're taking a look at the um, I.O. configuration, right? So this is the back, this is the DDR5, this is the DDR4, right? So HDMI DP, 20 gigabits, 20 gigabits. Um, of course, five gigabits, five gigabits, so five gigabits, five gigabits, 10 gigabits, 10 gigabits, 2.5G, but then you see here Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and then multi-channel audio with optical output, okay? So uh, the kind of the upgrade you have there is you go to Wi-Fi 6E and DDR5, right? Um, so that's pretty much gonna be your, key, your QD, your, excuse me, your, Q, uh, your, uh, your key two differences, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and just see right there. Um, 
I can't see the DDR5 version online. Why is that? That's because it's brand new. We're unveiling it. We're just unveiling it today. So it's, it's just getting ready to be unveiled. So, um, you know, we're unveiling here the Apex today. We're unveiling the Tough Gaming DDR5 and the Pro Art models. So that's the reason why that it hasn't been, right? So Braytheon is commenting about USB, excuse me, Bluetooth performance. Uh, Bluetooth performance is outstanding for the latest generation Bluetooth 5 and up to 5.3, which is going to be on the latest Wi-Fi 6C based controllers and even on the Wi-Fi 6, which would still be Bluetooth 5.2. But many users forget that you do need to always make sure to connect the antenna. Without the antenna, um, you will actually significantly lower the overall stability and the throughput performance for Bluetooth. Although Bluetooth, of course, is not as contingent on bandwidth as, let's say, Wi-Fi is, but do make sure to connect those antennas if you want to be able to ensure the best Bluetooth performance, okay? All right, let me go ahead and just see if we have any questions on that. If not, uh, we're going to get ready to go into the Prime series. Um... So Pusios is saying, how much better memory is the OC on the Apex going to be versus the Extreme when running one DPC? So assuming what you're meaning is essentially how much better in a two DIM configuration, right? Um, it's kind of hard to quantify that from a specific kind of percentage perspective, um, but I would say it's a noticeable uh, benefit, especially once you start to get into the higher margins. So um, 7,000 is gonna be probably about the breaking point that you'll see consistently on most IMCs. And as you start to get into, let's say the better quality the IMCs, which would be 74 to about 7,800, you'll start to see more delineation. And even with on the same motherboards, there'll be a little bit less likelihood. Um, going into the one DPC configurations, right? One SPC, one DPC configurations, you'll see that the Apex will be smoother in terms of that scaling support uh, with the same type of IMCs. So definitely when you're taking a look at that, your the success rate of a good quality IMC um, and a board, 7,800 would be more realistically achievable on a Apex right than it would necessarily be on an extreme although we again have validated that on there but that is still very much contingent on the quality of the imc um, but uh, I would say that, you know, if you're really somebody that is targeting memory kits that are going to be over 7,400, I would strongly look at the Apex as kind of being your focus model um, because it means that you're really kind of doubling down on, on, on scalability in terms of the DRAM frequency, right? Um... What's the speed on the Ethernet? If I didn't note that, it is still 2.5 gigabit. So it's still the i226 uh, 2.5 gigabit on both the DDR4 and the DDR5. So there's no difference. You're going to still have DDR uh, 2.5 gigabits not working on both of those motherboards. It's only the difference in terms of the Wi-Fi specification where you have Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Okay. Okay. All right. I think that uh, we've got you covered there in terms of the tough gaming guys. So let's get ready to look at the, um, let's look at the prime and the pro art. Or actually, I'll let you guys decide. Do you guys want to do the pro art or do you guys want to do the prime as we wrap this up here? Let me know in the chat while I put this, this, this motherboard away. And if anybody had any of the questions there on uh, the tough gaming series, then let me know or on any of the other motherboards. Um, if you had any other questions that I didn't get the chance to get into, I try to get to the chat when I can, but it's a little bit tricky as I'm sure you guys imagine. So let me just go ahead and know. Okay. And we will go ahead and get to the next board, which like I said, we'll either do Prime or Pro Art. So let me know in the chat which one's gonna be. And I'm gonna take them both out right now at the same time uh, because we kind of somewhat segment them to be kind of similar. And uh, there will be some other uh, Prime boards that I'll, I'll show here on the stream, but I don't have, because we do actually have the more entry dash P, and we also have the dash M, uh, yeah, the dash M plus, uh, for those that are interested in micro ATX. Is JJ buried in motherboards, Davina? Yes, JJ is buried in motherboards. <laughs> All right, so here we go. We've got 
the ProArt. One of my absolute favorite looking motherboards in our lineup is the ProArt series. I think it's a great looking board. And then one of my other absolute favorites, the Prime with the space theme, um, I think is absolutely fantastic looking. It's right up there. I mean, it's really one of the best looking motherboards that I think we have ever done. I think the space theme is really fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Hugo. Appreciate that. It's very nice of you. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and put these guys side by side. And uh, let me see. What, what was the overall uh, response? Pro art looks like pro art. Pro art, pro art, pro art. Okay, so yeah, so it looks like um, pro art was the winner in terms of actually being the motherboard uh, that we're going to look at first. Uh, so we'll look at Prime after pro art. So give me one second here. We're going to look at the pro art first. But I'm going to go ahead and just put them side by side really quick, guys. So if you guys want to check them out. Here's the Prime. This is using, uh, the, of course, the space the theme design, which I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite design aesthetics that we've maybe done. I've been with the company 15 years, and I really do think it's one of my favorite design aesthetics that we've ever done on the motherboard. And then here, uh, we're going to put the Pro Art. All right, so there we can go. Um, two fantastic looking motherboards. Uh, the Pro Art has a really kind of distinct uh, styling that's very monochrome, very refined in terms of its design silhouette, um, has this nice kind of just little bit of gold accenting. It has this diffused, semi-opaque uh, IO shroud, which I think is really, really nice. It looks really cool. I love the design curves uh, are on this, very angled, but with a little bit of a chamfer in some sections. And then here you have kind of this really refined iconography and design styling that brings a lot of homage from space themed designs so overall really really cool i think that they look fantastic right so overall two great designs prime series and the pro art series um, two great options and so again for those of you who are kind of wondering what the difference is is that any one of the motherboards we've talked about of course can be used for a gaming based build but um, you know we do segment the tough gaming rg strix and the rg maximus as our dedicated gaming series with the prime and the pro art series our focus is um, kind of as models that are focused for creators for professionals for productivity and the prime series is really kind of actually like a jack of all trades is really it's a model that we do design as being kind of a great representation of asus and its motherboard lineup so regardless of what your build intent is, it's a great option for you to consider. Um, so it's a very well-rounded specification um, set that's going to be offered on the Prime Series. Uh, and Pro Art Series, as we'll get into it, you'll see that it has a focus that's going to be a bit higher end. Um, not necessarily maybe on the same high end as in the Maximus, but it'll definitely offer some very high-end specifications that is quite similar to some of the higher end boards in terms of the I.O. and um, uh, expansion support that is offered, including things like dual PCI Express Gen 5, um, dual LAN, including 10G, and some other things. So um, we're actually, yeah, we'll, we'll look at the Pro Art first. So let me go ahead and get the Pro Art here. All right. Okay, very, very cool. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at the Pro, uh, Pro Art. And the Pro Art, there's no need to kind of really show you any lighting because there's no RGB lighting on this board. Um, so it is a very clean and refined design aesthetic. So if you're somebody that, um, you know, you just want a clean, nice looking board, then that is going to be the board for you. This is going to be a DDR5 based motherboard. So it is not a DDR4 based motherboard. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look right here. So this is going to be the Z79 Creator Wi-Fi. Okay, and in terms of the overall design aesthetic right here, you can see, again, that really clean design, black monochrome design aesthetic, those gold accents, that nice really diffused shroud that we have here that runs from the entirety of the top, the IO shroud all the way down. Looks really clean, looks really nice. I love that. Um, really nice little design. Even this little thing is a little accent. We actually added this, is kind of cool. You can remove this in terms of a little bit of a 
tag right there. Um, we'll take a little bit of a flyover on the board, but here's just a little bit of a design layout language so you can kind of just see what it looks like. Okay. All right, and uh, you'll see one accessory. The only reason why I wanted to bring this up right here is that there's gonna be two items that are gonna be important to keep here, is that this model does come with an activation card right here for Control Center Express, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And it also has a DP to DP cable. And you might be asking, well, why does it have a DP and DP cable? And that's because the actual IO on this on the board is gonna be a little bit different um, than on some of the other motherboards. So let's go ahead and uh, take a closer look here at the ProArt and see how it actually stacks up, so. Give me a second here. We will bring up the pro art. Okay. All right. So um, when we take a look here at the pro art. We're going to see that we've got uh, a very, very nice uh, overall kind of level of specification support, quite high end. So uh, when we take a look here at the rear I.O., you're going to see that you've got um, two, four, and then right here, you're going to see that you've got six, right? So you can see four and then eight. So you have a total of eight um, ports that are going to be all on the rear. But the big difference is if you take a look at the speed of those ports, right? One, there's no legacy USB 2 ports. Oh, cut myself again. Um, there's no legacy USB 2 ports and there's no five gigabit ports. So these are all 10 gigabit ports. So that's gonna be one big upgrade that you're gonna see compared to many of the other motherboards. The other thing too, of course, is you're gonna have two USB 4 or Thunderbolt 4 ports that are gonna be that are gonna on, on this motherboard as well, right? Dual LAN, so 2.5 gig and 10G. So if you were somebody that really wanted 10G and you don't wanna to go to the extreme, then this is a really great option because it gives you the ability to have that 10G, have the Thunderbolt connectivity, have also the Wi-Fi 6E support, right? Um, and then also you'll see right here that this board has kind of like the most complete level of Thunderbolt specification. So we do have uh, Thunderbolt enabled monitors, USB-C enabled monitors. If you want the flexibility to be able to run out and have the display configuration work, then you do need to be able to actually output from your graph into the actual display uh, input function. And so that's the reason why you have that loopback cable there. So you need to be able to actually go to the DPN um, and then be able to leverage that. So that's the reason why you actually have the DPN functionality on this board. So that is quite different than the other motherboards which don't really kind of design at giving you that. They're focusing kind of that USB 4 and that Thunderbolt 4 for kind of high speed external storage, but maybe not necessarily for kind of like daisy chain um, kind of hub configurations. So that is where you'll kind of see a little bit more of a difference between, let's say the creator board and some of the other motherboards that would be utilizing Thunderbolt 4, okay? Um, now, in terms of the IO specification support right here, um, it's quite robust when we then move over also internally, where you can see you have PCI Express Gen 5 for the primary by 16, and then that secondary by 16 is also PCI Express Gen 5. So that means that can run by 8 and by 8. So that's very similar to the high end Maxima series motherboards, where the Tough Gaming and the RG Strict series do not give you the ability to run by 8 and by 8. They don't have dual PCI Express Gen 5 slots. There's essentially only one PCI Express Gen 5 slot. So again, if you wanted another option, which would be uh, below, say, something like the Extreme or like the Hero, then you have this as an option, right, to be able to go with that. You still have also the Q-release design technology, which is cool. You have the 60-watt charging with the, also the USB 2, USB 3.2, 20 gigabits connector. So 20 gigabits internally on here and also that 60-watt charging support. Um, for the M.2 base SSDs, you'll see that you have one M.2 base SSD, another M.2 base SSD, and then another two M.2 base SSDs, right? So one, two, three, four. Now it is important to note that in terms of that specification support, right, these are all going to be PCI Express Gen 4. They're not PCI Express Gen 5. So there is not PCI Express Gen 5 support. If you did want to do PCI Express Gen 5 via M.2 SSD though, you do have that secondary slot that you have available to you. So depending on how you wanted to set things up, that is an option for you to be able to have access to a PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 base SSD, right? But um, by default, the four slots that are on this motherboard are all going to be PCI Express Gen 4, 
Okay. Audio design is our Crystal Sound S21220A, which is a very good audio codec, still has audio grade capacitors on there. Um, it has a DTS audio suite that comes along with it as well. Um, you still do have ARGB headers on there. So if you wanted to have a, a um, you know content creation build that has RGB connectivity, that is still going to be an option available to you. So you don't have to kind of be stressed that if you know you wanted that level of flexibility from aesthetic perspective, that would still be available to you. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go a little bit more closer on the board here. Um, but um, again, to kind of recap at a point right here, keep in mind that the actual expansion support on this board, right, you have PCI bifurcation support. So it's uh, PCI Express Gen 5 right here. That's full by 16, then by 8, and then you have a by 4 slot that's going to be present on there, right? So that is going to be one of the key differentiation points between uh, this board and another motherboard uh, when we talk about kind of that PCI slot configuration, okay? Um, see right here. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and go over to the physical tour of the board. Um, and I don't think I talked about the, um, the power stage configuration on this one. This one is a 16 plus one power stage configuration. So it is a very high performance based power stage configuration that's on in this board. Uh, 16 plus one, 70 amp power stages. And these are all SPS based power stages. Okay. So here we go. We can see the board a little bit more closely. Uh, keep in mind, this is not visible to you. If I switch, maybe I can actually switch it. Uh, but this is this is just a little board that I'm kind of holding the motherboard on. So don't think that that's part of the motherboard, okay? Um, so in terms of your uh, fan headers, again, you have your AIO pump header. You've got your CPU and CPU OPT. You've got the uh, same three ARGB and one legacy uh, 12 volt um, for your uh, RGB headers. You have your... Uh, primary uh, pro cool power connector so that's thicker pins just like all the other motherboards and then supplemental power connector you want to ideally connect posts for uh, better thermal balancing large robust vrm heat sinks right here that make contact with both the power stages and also uh, the inductors right the chokes um, pci supplemental power for that 20 gigabit internal USB C to give you up to 60 watt um, fast charging support you have the q release for ejection for the graphics card um, now for the m.2 base ssds again you have one m.2 two m.2 3m.2 4m.2 these do not have the dual contact design so again if you want the dual contact design you're going to want to be looking at the like the rog um, strix or you want to take a look at the rog maximus series based motherboards for that so i'm just going to go ahead and remove this just for reference so you can see but uh, these do all still maintain that nice Q release design, right? So you can easily install the M.2 base SSD and you also have your thermal pad right there um, to be able to make sure that you're getting the heat dissipation. Um, in terms of your internal USB 3, you have one internal legacy USB 3, six SATA ports right there, and then two SATA ports down at the bottom. So I know that some uh, professionals are of course still using SATA. I, I actually have quite a number in one system. I actually have uh, eight SATA drives. So this is great for me to still be able to have eight SATA based M.2 SSD, excuse me, eight SATA drives, and then also be able to have multiple M.2 SSDs, two internal USB 2 headers, um, another fan header, another fan header, and another fan header, and then uh, there's another fan header and another fan header right there. So quite a number of fan headers to be able to give you a lot of flexibility. And um, also another point is that the uh, ProArt does actually offer um, ASUS AIOC functionality, which is nice. So if you do want to be able to have ASUS AI overclocking support, then you do have that on this motherboard, okay? So while, um, you know, that often gets kind of discussed for our, our, our ROG series, um, it is going to be upgraded where we'll have ASUS AIOC, where take, for instance, like the tough gaming model doesn't have the ASUS AIOC functionality, okay? All right, so that is going to be the ProArt-based um, motherboard. Let me go ahead and just quickly see if we've got any questions there on the ProArt. And uh, for DDR memory too, also keep in mind, we have already validated uh, this motherboard with support for over 7,000 MT. So again, um, because actually memory 
on, on a content creation side, actually, especially for DRAM bandwidth for applications that do a lot of decompression, compression, um, that are actively pulling through memory can actually show quite benefits. Um, that is a cool aspect that on this motherboard, even if you wanted to be able to run like a, um, you know, a 32 gigabyte or a 64 gigabyte and be talking about high uh, DDR5 frequency, it is entirely possible on this motherboard. Uh, it has very good memory topology and design in that regard. So you don't have to kind of worry about it in that respect, okay? Um, now, one other thing that I want to be able to touch on here is going to be the ASUS Control Center Express technology, and that is going to be in relation to the um, to the to the LAN. Let me see if I have actually. I don't know if I have a slide here that I can actually show it to you guys on. So give me one second. Okay, yeah, I don't actually have one that I can show it to you, but with uh, Control Center Express, pretty much you have kind of like an out of band management option available to you. So that if you want to be able to have low level access to the motherboard, so if you were maybe like rendering rendering on the system or doing something on it, you could walk away from the system. Uh, you could then actually go open up the web browser and be able to actually see the system in terms of its temperatures, its loading policy. You can actually have different actually options for activating and managing the actual system through the actual network interface. So it's a very cool level of functionality normally something you would see more kind of like on server and workstation based motherboards but we brought over that control center express technology from our server and workstation boards and put that on the ProArt series and so um, it's not something that sometimes people are thinking about but that is a feature and function that is also kind of a distinguishing element on the ProArt series just like it has that more expensive io so that is going to be the asus control center express all right um let me go ahead and just see. Does it still have the Q connector? Um, actually, that's a good question. Uh, let me check and see if I have the image for what's inside the box. Um, I don't think it has the Q connector. I don't think many of the new boards no longer have the included Q connector, but it might have. Let me see here. I think it does. I think it does. I'm not sure. Let me see if I can find the picture. Up. Oh. Yep, I have the picture right here. Okay, yep, so in that original image, there it is right there. It does still come with the Q connector. So if you do want the Q connector, uh, you get essentially your M.2 rubber pads right here. You have these essentially Q latches, uh, SATA cables, the control center express activation, uh, the DP cable, and then your, of course, your wireless antenna for your Bluetooth and your Wi-Fi, okay? Tommy King is saying, can you run 128 gigabytes full speed DDR5? So that's kind of like a misnomer because 128 gigabytes, it depends all on your configuration. So um, right now there's actually no 128 gigabyte kit that's even available on the market. So if you do 128 gigabyte, you're actually running it yourself. But I've already actually showed active demos in the past of actually running 120 gigabyte and Z690 at higher than default. So in the past, actually, if you run a high density configuration, um, so 2P, 2 DPC, 2 SBC configuration, like 120 gigabytes, you are either going to be running the official spec, which was from the Intel port table, either 3600 MT or 4000 MT, not even 4800 MT, which was only for one DPC, one SPC based configurations. And now while Intel in this generation has a higher performing IMC, which now goes up to 5600 MT, you still have actually a lower um, actually level of support when you go to a two DPC, two, uh, excuse me, two DPC, two SPC configuration. So four DIMMs, which would be right now how you would achieve 120 gigabytes. Um, that being noted, you can still actually run nominally higher than that value at 128 gigabyte configurations. And that's already something that I already showed where in the past I showed um, 128 gigabytes running on our motherboards uh, without any issues at even like 4800 MT, which would generally be about the nominal value because most of those 120 gigabyte kits are not kind of ultra high performance. Um, the IMC though being better for this generation, you're gonna see that value break 5000 MT. So you will be able to run higher values. Um, I'd have to probably spend a little bit more time to double check with our team. That's not a configuration that we normally test as much um, because it's just not as common generally in kind of a more professional environment. Users aren't as critically focused on bandwidth frequency right as they are on density and reliability right um, that being noted there's an interesting balance where you can run higher frequencies um, and still get very good reliability and, and high density now with ddr5 under 64 gigabyte configurations but my initial expectation would be that you should probably be able to see a more comfortable range of maybe 52 to maybe upwards of about 56. Um, so, but keep in mind that's non non official configurations. Those are overclocked configurations because there is no overclocked 120 gigabyte kits. You're buying two kits of memory, combining them together, and you're going to have to manually set the memory divider. Okay. 
Um, and if you, again, do, uh, don't understand that, watch our DDR5 videos that we've put out on the YouTube channel and consider um, checking out our DDR5 Insight posts, uh, which uh, we have in our PCDIY group, okay? Um, are faster DDR5 just being tested for Z690 or also for Z? Um, we do do interoperability backwards testing, so we do do validation on both. But again, um, the highest frequency is being ultimately validated first and foremost on Z6, Z790 and 13th gen on Z790 because we also, as I noted in the very beginning, have done more kind of optimization to signal integrity for Z790-based motherboards to even further maximize the scaling that is available on the Raptor Lake IMC. Okay. Um, on the pro, uh, uh, excuse me, on the um, price, I do not have the price point yet, Birdman, on the uh, pro art based motherboard, so I can't tell you that right now. So you just have to keep it tuned. Um, in terms of availability, probably availability sometime next month. Uh, again, if you watch our weekly PCDIY streams, we'll give updates in that regard, or you can also make sure to be part of our PCDIY group, and I'll have a featured post announcement when we release it in terms of availability. Okay. Uh, Chris, that's a really great question. The activation um, a server is retired four years from now. Does this lose its ability to do Control Center Express? Um, I, I can't tell you that. So I would say email me, pcdow.asus.com, and I will check with our team. We recently implemented this functionality, and normally many companies that offer this type of functionality will charge you for it, um, but we give you Control Center Express as kind of part of the value-add experience of our motherboards. Um, but I can't necessarily tell you how that would break down. So um, to make sure to give you the right answer, email Email me and I'll, and I'll check with our, our headquarters team on um, how that might work out, okay? Okay, all right. I think that it covers us for the pro art based motherboard. Um, when will the Strix boards be available? Strix boards are already uh, online, um, so you should already kind of be seeing them, so there shouldn't be any uh, regards in that, right? All right, so um, let me go ahead and get ready to. Uh, jump into the prime base motherboard, okay? And while I bring that up, let me know if anybody has any other uh, questions um, while I get ready to go ahead and bring that up, okay? I guess I can actually can just swap these right here. All right, there we go. All right, very good. Let's get into our last board here, which will be our Prime Series. Okay, very cool. So in the Prime Series, uh, we will actually have quite a number of motherboards. You'll see right there. I'm going to focus pretty much on the Dash A Wi-Fi. I will touch a little bit on the Dash P because I think the Dash P is a really great value proposition if you guys are really kind of want to keep your budget low and you still want Z790. Uh, but you can see right there we have the Dash A Wi-Fi, which is this primary model that we'll focus on. We then have the Dash P. Um, the Dash P will offer it in two variants, a DDR5 and a DDR4 base variant. And you'll also have a Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi base variant. And then at the very end there, you'll also see that we have the M plus, which will be an actual micro ATX uh, based motherboard. So let me go ahead and just quickly show you guys uh, the Prime series, just kind of from a general perspective so you can see what those kind of models look like. So here we have the Prime dash A. Uh, this is the M plus, and this is the dash P. And so this is the DDR5 version, but again, remember we have a DDR4 version. I love all of these. These are great options, again, for those of you who might be on a little bit more of a budget, but still want to be able to get into Z790. They have a great ID design. These are also really great options, I think, if you want to balance out going with maybe either still 12th gen series CPUs, so something like a 12400 series or a 13600, right? But keep in mind that uh, even if you want to run like a 13700K, a 13900K in the dash A, you could still entirely run that without any issues, okay? So 
that is going to be uh, the Prime Series boards that we have uh, there. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of a flyover in terms of the Dash A. We'll bring up then the IO breakdown and uh, that will get ready close to wrapping things up for us guys. But um, I will still make sure that if we have any other questions, I will jump into those. All right, so let's go ahead and take a closer look. Here we go. This is the Prime Dash A. I really love the design aesthetic for the Prime Dash A. It's a really, really clean design language on it. Has this kind of cool little translucent uh, housing right here. Nice silver accents with nice kind of smooth design. This is a fully extended heat sink, so there's actually quite a bit of surface area here. Dual contact design makes full contact with the power stages as well as the inductors. Um, nice robust heat sink design. Again, you can run a 1300K overclocked on here and you're not gonna have any issues. You can actually see how it even extends out to give you a little bit more surface area right there. In terms of uh, power connectors, dual uh, 8-pin EPS power connectors right there with ProCool power design as well. CPU power connector, AIO, excuse me, a CPU fan connector, AIO connector, and then CPU OPT. So of course you can run your tower heat sinks or 240, 280 millimeter AIO solutions. Uh, you're good to go. You got two uh, RGB headers that are gonna be right there. One three pin, one four pin. You have then your internal type C, legacy USB three. You have the Q release design that's gonna be on there. Uh, you have the QLED diagnostic system in there, no debug based LED. Uh, PCI Express Gen five by 16 slot that's gonna be on there. Uh, another chassis fan header right there, another chassis fan header right there, another chassis fan header right there, and another chassis fan header right there. So tons of chassis fan headers. Um, we do also give you um, two options which are gonna be right here. This should be the power button, and I think this is also clear CMOS. So nice also as an upgrade here that normally we haven't always offered that on Prime series. So uh, you're going to have right there the clear CMOS button and the power button that's going to be on there. Uh, you've got two SATA ports and two SATA ports. So that's four SATA ports, two internal USB 2 ports that are going to be on there. And then the audio design is you have the Crystal Sound 3.0 isolated audio design. And then in terms of the M.2 SSDs, um, I took off one of the uh, heat sinks right there, so normally it would be right there, so don't worry, it does actually come with uh, the M.2 heat sink. So normally you have one right there, you have another right there, and then you've got two right there. So four M.2 ACE SSDs uh, can all be installed on there, and they all have their own individual M.2 SSD heat sinks, so you're good to go. Um, but you'll just see very similar to kind of like Tough Gaming, there's no rear dual heat sink design so not a heat sink on the bottom and on the top you just have it for the top but you still have the q latch design to allow you to easily install the m.2 base ssds right uh, let's get ready to go ahead and look at uh, just the key io information on this board so give me a second to bring this one up here and let me just see here um Okay, so let's go and uh, get ready to kind of dive into this one right here. All right, so here is going to be the Z790-A. So uh, taking a look at the rear I.O. on the Z790-A, we have two USB. These are going to be five gigabits, five gigabits. So that's two. And then we have 10 gigabits, right? And then we also have Type-C and Type-C. So um, quite nice in terms of five gigabits, 10 gigabits, and also 20 gigabits. So, so do keep in mind, again, no legacy USB 2 on there. So you still have two, four, six, eight, eight ports. That's a nice amount of ports. Wi-Fi 6E as opposed to just standard Wi-Fi 6. Um, you then have your audio output, and that's going to be with the S12-20A audio codec and the DTS audio suite, uh, DP and HD TP and HDMI that are going to be present on there. Um, keep in mind, if you want premium things like the clear CMOS all right on the back, that would be like on the RG Strix, but keep in mind this board does give you the clear CMOS button on the motherboard and a power button also on the motherboard. So those are nice little upgrades, okay? Um, one two, three, and four. So four M.2 SSDs that are going to be on this motherboard, but critically no PCI Gen 5. If again, you want PCI Gen 5 for M.2 SSD, you got to look at a motherboard like the Dash E or go into the Maximus series. Um, if you want to be able to have that specification support, PCI Express Gen 5 on that primary physical by 16, right? And then you've got a by one, a by four, a by one. And then you also have here a, uh, 
a by four slot, but it is a physical by 16 slot, right? Electrically, it's by four. Okay. Um, I ran overall pretty much on all those headers, so I don't need to recap that. And then you also have the internal Thunderbolt header that is on the Prime motherboard. Now, one thing that is a little bit of a change on this generation, this board does not have Asus AIOC. So if you want Asus AIOC, you will need to be looking at the uh, ProArt motherboard. You'll need to take a look at the ROG Strix series or you need to take a look at the ROG Maximus series. Okay. So that is a little bit of a change. Do keep in mind if you want Asus AIOC, it is not on. Uh, the Z790-A, okay? Um, and let me just see here if there's any other kind of elements that we touch on. Uh, I think I already noted on those on the back, right? But um, uh, this is a 16 plus one in terms of the overall power stage configuration that's gonna be on this model. 2.5 gigabit, which is the same I226, um, 2.5 gigabit that's gonna be on here, and then the Wi-Fi 6E that we already talked about, integrated IO shield, which are all nice upgrades. And those are really nice things, again, if you're coming over from a much older base motherboard where you may not have that. Some people also wonder about what this stack cool plus three might mean that you'll see on motherboards. Essentially, that is gonna be a additional copper layer that we'll have on the motherboards, which helps improve uh, thermal dissipation, especially around the CPU socket area when you have uh, cores um, so many cores and uh, essentially pulling so much power you can produce quite a bit of heat for the actual PCB so actually having that essentially uh, two ounce copper layer that's in there helps to actually provide additional thermal dissipation for the PCB itself so when you see stack cool three plus that is actually what is being referred to um, when we talk about that from a design perspective okay uh, let me go ahead and just see uh, any questions right there uh, Josh M is why a single audio out. So the uh, main reason why is that in our feedback polling, we found that just users aren't doing multi-channel audio, right? M um, the vast majority of users are only doing uh, either a stereo set of speakers or they're doing uh, headphones. And if they're actually doing generally multi-channel audio, it usually comes through HDMI and you could still do that actually on your graphics card because it's not contingent actually on the onboard audio uh, that would be on here. So you have that flexibility if you still wanna be able to support that, right? Um, does the Prime come with postcodes or LEDs? It comes with the QLED. So you have the four LED diagnostics, right? CPU, DRAM, graphics card, and boot device. Um, if you want postcode, you would have to be looking at one of the higher end base motherboards. So uh, does the top M.2 slot, so remember in terms of the way that the actual um, uh, PCI lane allocation is designed for Intel is that there's always essentially those 16 lanes from the CPU and then there's always gonna at least be four lanes that are provided for one slot directly for um, one primary PCI NVMe M.2 base SSD. So one slot will actually be optimally be able to be routed to the CPU link lanes and then other ones would be routed to, to the chipset or would actually cut into um, your actual PCI Express graphics uh, um, lanes. But even if they cut into the graphics card lanes, it's irrelevant because it doesn't matter because you could run a 4090 at 8x Gen 4 and it would not be limited in terms of its performance. Okay. Um, Michael P, yeah, we talked about that in the very beginning when we talked about the Maxima series motherboards. Uh, we'll probably have a little bit more of a concrete update a little bit later this week. Um, probably tomorrow, I, I'll give an update, but we hope to probably have availability information maybe by the very end of this month in terms of availability, if not early next month. So just stay tuned in that regard, okay? Um, does this one have USB BIOS flashback? It does not have USB BIOS flashback, right? Um, did you already present the Apex? I did already go over the Apex. You can find it earlier in the stream. I covered all the Maxima series boards in the very beginning of the stream, okay? Hey Arnold, um, you know, so pricing is an interesting aspect. I think, you know, one important thing to kind of keep in mind when you talk about any type of pricing assessment on motherboards is that some users want to kind of compare cost to prior generations, but you have to take a look at the overall complexity of boards, right? So even if we take a look at maybe like a Z170 series motherboard, which was quite feature rich, um, the PCB layer design was actually less complex and there was less layers. The vast majority of motherboards, we're now talking about at least six layer motherboards, if not eight layer motherboards. We're adding in then copper substrate layers to 
that are in addition to that. You then actually go into maybe more specialized motherboards, like on the Maximus, where we go to low loss series based motherboards. Then add in the complexity for PCI Express Gen 5 and DDR5. Um, PCI Express Gen 5 and even PCI Express Gen 4, compared to motherboards that didn't even have that specification support, might not actually have to have specialized uh, quick switches and muxes and read drivers. So pure add on cost in terms of just producing the motherboard is considerably more complicated. This is even withstanding um, so many of the factors in the last couple of years in terms of supply chain, logistics, production costs, and so many other elements coming out of the pandemic, which are also reality in terms of production, right? But if we physically even talk about board complexity, um, we even have more microcontrollers that are on motherboards. The extreme alone, right, comes not only with the highest level of VRM design that we've ever put on a motherboard in terms of the power componentry, then the PCB, then complex technologies, which are yield-wise challenging to produce because they're very complicated, like the anime matrix display, 10G-based networking, the Thunderbolt, the dual Thunderbolt technology and having actually connector and layout sequencing for an internal Thunderbolt 4 header and then rear Thunderbolt, right? Which I don't know any other manufacturer that actually is even doing that dual Thunderbolt implementation. Then add in, you know, the the uh, uh, ARGB and fan controller that comes included with there, the Voltition, which also comes included with the actual card. And you begin to see the depth and complexity of actually what we're doing, even mechanisms like the Q release design, right? Again, which you might think is small, but it's a physically more complicated design mechanism that has to be put on motherboard was never even on boards in the past, right? And then even uh, other material costs where we talk about heat sinks and, and material costs are even higher because we're using even more of it uh, for more thermal dissipation performance. So there's a lot of factors that go into uh, board complexity. Um, and, you know, we and, and again, this is not even talking about even subtle things that many times people don't add to the cost of a product that do exist with things like maybe the differential die sense voltage monitoring technology, which is also an additional cost, true dual independent um, ROM files for vBioses, excuse me, not for vBioses, but for um, uh, UBFI BIOSes. So there's a lot of different factors uh, that influence pricing. OK. All right. Um, but let's uh, go back here and see if uh, there's any other questions there on the Prime series. If not, um, we'll probably get ready to kind of get ready to wrap this up here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, show you guys the Dash P a little bit more closely because I, I'm a big fan of the Dash P as well here. So let me actually show you the Dash P a little bit more close up. So you'll see uh, still large, nice, robust VRM heat sinks on here. You still actually have power stages that are going to be present on this board as well. Um, you notice that the big drop down is going to be on like the number of M.2 heat sinks where you saw on the Dash A. Pretty much all the drives had M.2 heat sinks were here. You can see you've got one M.2, two, and then you've got three right here. So you have the ability to support uh, three M.2 base SSDs, right? Um, but uh, you don't have those additional M.2 base heat sinks, right? Um, but you still have quite a bit of, you know, connectivity that's available to you. You still have Wi-Fi 6 that's going to be on this board. You still actually have multiple ARGB headers that are going to be on here. Internal USB-C, legacy USB 3. Um, got four, of uh, course, SATA ports right there. You actually have dual front USB 3, which is pretty rare uh, for an entry-level model. So you have one USB 3 here, and you have another USB 3 here, and the Type-C connector right there. And... Uh, this board, I do believe, actually, let me see if it does have the readout for it. Um, I don't remember for a fact. Yeah, this one also still has a Thunderbolt header. So you could even still do Thunderbolt on this entry Z790-P uh, model. So, um, you know, again, we have two versions of the Dash P. We'll have a DDR4 version and a DDR5 version. But again, if you kind of wanted to go something that was a little bit more cost accessible, this is a great option. And also, there's a lot of Z690 motherboards that are great that if you actually really want to talk about value, they're, some of the boards are actually lower than their original launch pricing. But, um, you know, Z690, is now getting ready to be EOL, so it won't be maintained in terms of overall long-term production, right? So do keep that in mind, right? Um, and then lastly, we have also the uh, Dash M Plus, which is just the micro ATX version right here. So for those that you might want to do something in a small form factor build, this is another ICE option for you right here. So again, you still get nice, robust VRM heat sinks right there. Keep it overall nice and cool. Um, I think this would be a great pairing for something like a 13600K. Internal USB-C, USB 3 right here. 
four SATA ports that you're going to have on there. You still have Thunderbolt, so you can still run uh, the USB 4, Thunderbolt 4, if you want it on here. And you still have three M.2 SSDs on here. And this board does not come with Wi-Fi, but you can add Wi-Fi via the M.2 key um, for adding in an M.2 Wi-Fi module. Uh, when you take a look at the rear I.O., you've got two, four, six, eight. So that's still pretty decent in terms of the overall connectivity. Two USB 2 ports, one 10 gigabit, one USB-C right there, and then four 5 gigabits USB. Um, so overall, uh, it's a good mix. Um, I, like I said, uh, I think that's just a good option because there's some users that might just be looking for something that might be turnkey, stable, reliable platform, general productivity, maybe a little bit of gaming, you know, not necessarily having to go with, you know, some of more of the high-end offerings. So that's the nice thing about the Prime Series is you have some nice flexibility to be able to go from something like the higher end Dash A Wi-Fi, or you can go to the, pay, the, to the P models, right, with DDR4 or DDR5, or you could even go with something like the Dash M Plus, right? All right, so uh, let me go ahead and just see here if uh, we got any other quick questions right there. Uh, hey, Eva. Um, actually, I don't agree with that. Um, if you talk about the performance, the performance for the 1390K is outstanding, and I don't think that that's a kind of uh, a valid comparison for that kind of older processor. In terms of the power envelope, you know, the reality is is that anytime you go to a really high level of performance, you're going to be consuming a high level of power, and the power is also directly correlating to the workload, right? So you want to really evaluate that the overall um, the power that you're going to be consuming as well as the thermals are going to be in relation to what you're doing on the system. So you're not going to be seeing massive kind of power consumption if you're not running sustained multi-threaded workloads. Really, the only people that run those type of workloads are, I'd say, people in the kind of specific prosumer professional or maybe uh, developmental space, right, which might be running applications which are sustained usage across a high number of cores. For most general users under general desktop productivity, like me, I do gaming, I do, uh, of course, some streaming, I do, you know, um, some light editing you know for photography that i do from taking pictures of my dog or i'm going out and about and things like that the overall power envelope is actually quite reasonable um so you know i think it ultimately just comes down to what the use case scenario is and then you align your cpu based on you know the um the power envelope that you want to try to target and keep in mind there's also a lot of options that we give you within the uefi to tailor power consumption so if you want to maybe tailor to a specific power envelope you of course have that flexibility as well right so Um, so let's see here. Uh, JJ, I have a question. I pre-ordered three power supplies, a 1600 watt Thor. Um, so are the 1600 watt Thors ready for the 4090? Okay. So this is, uh, I think, okay. You just, I think you just spam the question there, but for clarification, um, one, you don't need a 1600 watt for a 4090, even if you had an overclock configuration or if you ran our overclocked 4090 Strix OC card, it doesn't matter. A thousand watt power supply is actually more than enough. Any of our current Thor series power supplies are all compatible with the current 4090 graphics cards. All of our 4090 cards come with the four pin, 16 pin power adapter cable, which will matrix out to essentially your eight pin uh, PCI Express cables. So that's inside the box and would be fully compatible with the Thor if that's the configuration you want to run. If if you wanted native 16 pin ATX 3.0 based power supplies, we'll have the Tough Gaming power supplies, which will be launching next month, which are fully modular and they'll go up to 1200 watts. Um, and that would be fine. But again, you don't need a 1600 watt. It doesn't matter almost any configuration you're running. It's just not realistic uh, required. Um, 1000 watt is more than enough because uh, again, the 4090 series also has much better transient power performance than the 30 series, uh, which means essentially it doesn't spike up as much in terms of the peak even power draw than the 3090 series. So, so in that regard, it's actually more efficient and it's less stressful on the power supply. So uh, 1600 watt, if that's what you want to run, it's more than enough. And if you do want a cable, um, we also will be offering Thor users in North America the ability to can contact our service and support team and get the um, 16 pin power adapter cable for the Thor power supplies as well. So you have two options essentially you can go through, okay? Uh, let me just go ahead and see, is there any other kind of questions? Uh, Eva Langley saying, why is the Prime better on the AM5? Actually, the design is the same. There's no, there's a really almost no difference uh, between uh, the Prime design on, um, on, excuse me, on the AMD Place platform to the uh, Intel platform. So they're, they're pretty much almost identical. So I don't, I don't think there's actually any difference, right? 
Okay, let me see if there's any last questions right here. Hey, Matthew, thanks for joining us here on the stream. Okay, I think that probably... Um, I have a Z690-E, yes, um, Papito, uh, ZD, uh, you're good. Any of our Z690 series motherboards and B660 series motherboards, um, they're 100% um, all good to go. So you just have to download the newer UEFI BIOS. We already have those available, and you can essentially drop in a 13th gen series processor. So if you have Z690, they are 100% compatible. You can get great experience, stock or overclocked from any one of our Z690 series motherboards. You don't have to worry about it in that regard. If you want to be able to move over and maybe you had like a 12600K and you want to go over to like a 13 1700k or 13900k that's entirely fine um, none of the motherboards are going to have any stability or reliability issues and they will offer a great overclocking experience okay Okay. All right, guys. I think overall that pretty much wraps up um, our uh, overall stream here on giving you guys the deep dive on the latest generation of Asus Z790 series motherboards. Uh, an absolutely fantastic set of motherboards that we have in terms of the stack, right, where uh, we've jumped into. Of course, we have the latest generation ROG Maximus series. So I'll go ahead and just recap those one more time just so uh, people can go ahead and just see what they look like as we get ready to wrap this up. I'll leave also the opportunity if anybody has any last questions that they want to get answered here i'm more than happy to go ahead and try to get into those so uh, for the rg maximus lineup again the three bundle boards that we will have is we will have the extreme we will have the hero and we will have the apex the extreme will be 999 it should be coming out in terms of availability in the not too distant future probably maybe very end of the month beginning of next month some time frame the maximus hero and then of course the apex the apex and the hero are the same price the apex you'll see is in that fantastic new id design with a white pcb and a white design theme i think it looks great for people that are wondering is there a formula is there a glacial no there's no formula and there is no glacial um, you may still potentially find those in the channel. So if you really like those models and they are compatible with 13th gen, I would say pick up a Glacial or pick up a, a Formula because once they are essentially uh, out in terms of no longer having available inventory, they will not be um, essentially reproduced, right? And we will not have variants for Z790 for the Formula or for the Glacial, okay? Um, moving on to the next side, let's go ahead and recap what we've got on terms of ROG Strix. So on ROG Strix, Let's go ahead and show our four boards that we're going to have here. So on ROG Strix, uh, let me go ahead and bring them up right here. ROG Strix is going to be four boards that we'll have here. It'll be the Dash E, the Dash F, the Dash A, and the Dash I, okay? And uh, this is ATX, 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 and this is, of course, Mini ITX. Uh, sizing is actually the same. It's just adjusted there just for the image, okay? Keep in mind, this is DDR5, 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 and the Dash A is DDR4, okay? DDR4, if you're interested in that, okay? Um, and then on the tough gaming side, right? Um, I showed images before, right? But let me go ahead and just bring them up one more time here. So I will show the two tough gaming models. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring those two up. All right, there we go. Uh, tough Gaming, uh, we will have two models. We have a DDR5 version and we will have a DDR4 version. Pretty much the boards will be identical. The main differential will be on the DDR5 version. It will be DDR5 and it will also have Wi-Fi 6E, while on the DDR4 version, it's DDR4 and we'll have Wi-Fi 6, okay? And then lastly, um, what, Pro, uh, Pro Art, right? Yeah, we got Pro Art. Let me go ahead and bring up our pro art here. Here we'll have the Z790 Pro Art, right? And this one, again, be available. Uh, just keep it tuned, probably early next month. Uh, again, really great option for those that want 10G, want dual PCI Express Gen 5, want Thunderbolt 4, right? Uh, this will be, I think, a really great option, right? And also supports up to four M.2 base SSDs. And then lastly, uh, just recapping what we just covered in terms of the Prime series, right? Um, let's finish recapping there the Prime models, which will be 
the dash A, the dash P. Remember, the dash P will come in DDR4 and a DDR5 variant, and then the dash M+. Plus. All right, so that overall gets you covered there in terms of all of our ASUS Z790 series motherboards. Make sure if you guys are interested, tomorrow we will have a launch live stream where we'll be doing some live overclocking. We're going to take this 13900K. We're going to go ahead and get it uh, cooled right here with our brand new Ryu 3. Uh, this is going to be our latest gen, 8th gen. Uh, Asa Tech based AIO cooler. We're going to go ahead and get that together on the test bench. We're going to be doing some overclocking, showing you some uh, DDR5 overclocking. We're going to do ASUS AIC overclocking, show you how that works, show you our cool integrated mem test functionality for DDR5, talking about some DDR5 insights, talking about some expectations in terms of what you can see in terms of core clocks um, broken down in terms of, I think, uh, you know, P cores, uh, E core overclocking. And uh, we'll also be touching on uh, the cool dynamic cache switching feature that we're also introducing. Uh, for Z790 series to allow you to even take performance beyond just yes, overclocking your P and your E cores, but overclocking your cache and even further maximizing performance. So uh, a lot of cool things. So make sure to join us for that stream tomorrow as well. All right, guys. Okay. Uh, I think that wraps up everything, everybody. So unless anybody has any last questions, we're going to go ahead and uh, I think that's it. Wrap it up. All right, guys. Um, with that, take care. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day. And if you guys have any other questions, comments, feedback, feel free to go ahead and either email PCDIY at ASUS.com or also go ahead and join us in our ASUS PCDIY group. You'll find the link in the description if you're checking us out on demand. So take care. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Best of luck with your builds.